Okay, we're ready to go. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome back to um, uh, the Market Surveillance Committee meeting. And uh, the two agenda items this afternoon concern local market power mitigation enhancements and the day ahead market enhancements. And um, the first agenda item, we'll, we have uh, three staff members from the ISO who are joining us. Uh, Elliot Nepikai will be speaking uh, first. He's a market design policy developer. Um, and then we'll be hearing from Brittany Dean and uh, Daniel uh, Table, if I'm correct? Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, and uh, for comic relief, I'll, I also have a couple slides on a technical issue that um, we'll be talking about at, at an appropriate time. So, Elliot, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Um, so, our, so our draft final proposal uh, was posted on January 16th. We had a stakeholder call um, just two days ago. And today, Brittany, Danielle, and I were going to be emphasizing the important changes that have been made um, since the revised draft proposal. So just as a reminder, this proposal has five elements, and that includes two proposed rules. The first is to uh, prevent flow reversal. The second, which I'll be discussing, is to limit economic displacement. Uh, the third introduces a default energy bid for hydro resources. And the fourth is a modification of the process for making reference level adjustments. Finally, we've uh, proposed consolidation of our published uh, gas price indices. So again, to summarize what's changed since the revised drop proposal, we've modified the formula that supports economic displacement. Uh, we've also consolidated our hydro debt calculation to a single formula that incorporates a uh, gas floor price, a uh, locational component with a 1.4% multiplier, and then a geographic component. And that is essentially capturing the long-term opportunities to sell in other areas. And finally, we've included a provision that will allow entities to consult with the CAISO on reference levels. And in addition, entities can base them on the same day gas prices observed on the International Continental Exchange. So I'm going to tackle the first bullet up here, and then uh, Brittany and Danielle, they'll jump in and, and cover the second two bullets. <clears throat> so economic displacement, just a brief review. Economic displacement occurs when a resource in an import-constrained area is redispatched as a result of mitigated prices. Now, when this happens, uh, the bid prices can lead to transfers beyond what is needed to resolve market power. And this is particularly concerning uh, during intervals when a resource's default energy bid is below its estimated marginal costs. Now, I'm going to review a more complex example a little bit later, but this is a simple case with just two BAs, and it essentially represents economic displacement in its purest form. So in the mitigation run, we have a bit of $80, and that leads to 300 megawatts of transfers. Now, in our current framework, the mitigation that occurs in the market run will lead to a lower default energy bid of $50. And with that lower price, it causes transfers to increase from 300 megawatts to 500 megawatts. So ultimately that 200 megawatt increase at a price that may be lower than the marginal cost for a resource in BAA1 represents that economic displacement. So here we have our proposed solution to address this concern. Now initially the proposed um, formula was a little bit simpler and it was just gonna limit transfers to the quantity in the market power run. But since the straw proposal, the formula has become a bit more complex. We've responded to comments from the MSC. We've had a, comments from some stakeholders as well. Um, and it, it's really to ensure we're considering not only the pre-mitigated transfer quantity, but we're also looking at the base transfer and finally adding in a flexible ramp upward requirement. So with the rule in place, what we end up with here is the same scenario from slide five, but in the market run, imports will be limited to 300 megawatts. And again, this is an extreme case. It's a very basic example. And I invite all of you to take a look at section 6.1.2 of the draft final proposal for additional detail. So 
just to summarize, and then we'll, we'll move to some discussion here, but just to summarize, we're proposing limiting exports to the greater of the base transfers or the pre-mitigated transfers, and then adding on the total flexible ramp up awards in excess of the BAA's flexible ramping up requirement. Now, this rule will be optional, and it'll be a selection in the master file, depending on the preference of each EIMBAA. Regarding congestion rents, any EIMBAA that elects to enforce this rule will receive all resulting congestion rents. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to review an example from the draft final proposal, and that aims to clear up uh, any confusion on congestion rents along with a, a few other concerns that we had heard on the revised draft proposal. So here we have four BAAs. So let us assume that 100 megawatts of imports from BAA 3, which could be the CAISO, and going into BAAs 1 and 2 and 4 creates that um, binding constraint and that, um, that bubble that you see uh, with the three BAAs. Now, in the mitigation run, um, let us also assume BAA2 elects to enforce this rule, and that's essentially going to limit those transfers to the quantity in the mitigation run. Now, we have 100 megawatts for BAA2 of net transfers. Uh, 200 is coming in, and 300 is going out. Now, with the proposed rule, BAA2 can instead allow transfers to increase in the market run with the assurance that they will be protected from economic displacement beyond what is needed to resolve market power. Moreover, BAA2 will still sell energy at mitigated prices, but the quantity would be limited to 100 megawatts. And the market run net transfers out of BAA2 will remain at the 100 megawatts, even with imports increasing from 100 to 200, and then from 300 to 400, from BAA2 to BAA1. So essentially what's happening here is it's allowing BAA4 to wheel power through BAA2 and, and then selling into BAA1. Now regarding congestion rents, we end up with $5 of a price difference between BAA2 and BAA1 for that 100 megawatt limit. And BAA2 will receive all those congestion rents. Now, without this rule, EIM BAAs would ultimately offer less transfer capability to avoid potential economic displacement. And that actually increases the chance of mitigation occurring in the first place. Now, as a result, it could also limit potential opportunities to wheel power through. So with that, I'll, um, I'll go ahead and pause for questions and then turn it over to Dr. Hobbs after that. Yep. Um, any questions or comments for the MSC members? Uh, yeah, we have to be very precise about some of this wording because, you know, you said all the congestion rents go to BAA, too, but I think that's not actually what the proposal is. It's specifically the congestion rents on the constraint for the BAA and that they're all, you'll also be enforcing, you know, other constraints, like there'll be a constraint between BAA 3 going into BAA2, and that, that, that's a different constraint that will be enforced, and everything, so that you could get a variety of situations in which different constraints are binding, and they won't, they, BAA2 won't be collecting, you know, 400 megawatts times the 31, and, uh, 31, uh, the $5 difference between 36 and 31. They'll only be collecting it on 100 because that's the amount that would be uh, on that BAA specific constraint would be enforcing. So I think it's important to be clear about that. I was confused by some of the discussion. Now we got it straight. So I want to make sure everybody else is so we, we understand the properties of, of what we're talking about here. That's uh, important. So there aren't actually, and there's no negative congestion rents there for between BAA 4 and BAA 1 because that's treated as a wheel through and there's, there's no congestion in this example. Uh, if you do the numbers, the total con Congestion rent here is um, seventeen hundred dollars, of which five hundred dollars would is due to that one constraint, and the other twelve hundred of that seventeen hundred is, you know, whoever owns owns the assets, and you know, however that's usually divided.
and if, you know, we don't want to wheel, uh, we don't want to lose that flexibility that you're, even if you're mitigated, you're supposed to be providing that uh, flexibility to the market participants and the, the EIM benefit is in part the, uh, the reduction in flexible capacity that we get from the diversity benefit. Uh, I have some concerns about the way this is formulated at present, and I think the, the way we've talked about it's a little bit different. We've talked about that basically everybody's brought this flexible capacity to the table, and that would not be blocked off. And I think it's important to uh, to recognize that when we're doing this in RTD, in the real-time dispatch, that the mitigated run is in an advisory run of the prior interval, and then the market, this, the, the, you know, the, the test run with unmitigated prices in a, is an advisory run. And then real time, we're actually running a dispatch using the mitigated offer prices. The load could be different. So that if you block off the and put a hard limit on the export constraint, it isn't like you're that get, having the amount of uh, exports that you did in the advisory interval is necessarily going to balance the system because the one of the reasons we have the flexi ramp is because things are not what we expected five minutes in the past. So we want to have some flexibility in there. Now the, the thing that concerns me about this formula is right now we take the amount that's the, the flexi ramp benefit is just the flexi ramp that's scheduled in the uh, balancing area in excess of the, their their local requirement. And I'm concerned that if the local requirement is, if the, if the amount that's scheduled is equal to the local requirement, then none is available to provide the benefit to the other balancing area. And that's part of the design is that there is supposed to be that benefit. Uh, so that I'm inclined to think that the, it should just be the flexi ramp that's scheduled, but they have to make that available. Uh, and that would not, that would be subject to mitigation. We wouldn't block it off. We wouldn't put in a hard constraint that kept the, the flexi ramp up from being available, but it would be subject to the penalty prices for flexi ramp. That there's, when you use flexi ramp and that causes the system to go short, the price goes up. So that would be reflected in the price, but it would, it would be subject to the, the mitigation and we would allow it to be dispatched. We wouldn't put in a hard constraint to, uh, to keep it from being dispatched up. So that's my thought about that element of the constraint. So, so, uh, this is Ben. So Scott, just to make sure I understand, you're, you're suggesting dropping the FRUR prime term, just making all the flexi ramp up award available. Right. And of course, it would be available at the penalty price calculated according to the form. So, so this is Don, to cut away from the ISO. So, you know, when we, we were looking at, you know, the FRUR, that is the amount of the BA's requirement that has to be met locally. And so I think the intent here was, oh, it has to be met locally, so you'd want to protect it from serving energy somewhere else because you want it to meet the flexible ramping up requirement. But the uncertainty that materializes locally. But you're arguing that actually the demand curve already provides you the right trade-offs for that. So, for example, if the demand curve for the local requirement was at $30 and the energy price was $1,000 in the neighboring balancing authority area, that you would say the benefit of the EIM is the BA that has this rule in place should forego uncertainty, meeting uncertainty in its BA because it's needed right now in the other BA. Uh, it, I agree. You would buy less FRU locally, but the FRU price locally should be higher too. Um, hello, this is George Angelides. Maybe we can see a numerical example on how we were thinking about this uh, to work for the uh, NPM to FMM. Uh, we can talk about RTD too, it's a little bit different, but for NPM to FMM, because exactly the same thing happens in, M in NPM and FMM, it's easier to compare. So let's say that the BA has a zero base, and um, in NPM there is an export of 100 megawatts, all right, um, a net export of 100 megawatts. Uh, so the first term there is 100, right? And let's go to the flexible ramp, let's say our adjusted requirements, um, taking into account any demand elasticity, let's say it's 50 megawatts, but we go and procure 60 megawatts from that BAA. So our rationale in here 
was that out of the 60 megawatts that we procure for capacity to meet uncertainty, the 50 megawatt portion is for, for meeting the uncertainty requirements of the BAA itself, and the additional 10 megawatts is for meeting uncertainty outside of the BAA as part of the EIM diversity. And we wanted to limit now in FMM the export uh, to the pre-mitigated export of 100 megawatts. There's no contention on that because that was with unmitigated prices, right? And then allow for an additional 10 megawatts because that 10 megawatt of additional flex program capacity that was procured was for the benefit of other BAA, so we don't want to block that one. But we didn't want to go all the way to allow the entire 60 megawatts because if we do that, then in the FMM run that comes next, what could happen is that the entire 160 megawatt under the limit could be allowed to be exported, and you may still procure another 50 megawatts of capacity internally to meet the local uncertainty requirements. So now, in our opinion, we see this as we allowed an additional 50 megawatts economic displacement that would not be there under the um, unmitigated prices. So that's, that's our rationale for this. Yeah, the, the concern is, though, that the, 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 the amount of flexi ramp that's, got, that's scheduled there reflects the diversity benefit. And uh, if we don't allow the, 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 the flexi ramp to be used, the other balancing area, suppose there's none scheduled in there because there's they can allow imports from the other area. Then you block off the imports from the other area. It's got no flexi. It's got no ramp. Right, but we don't block the 10 that was procured for the benefit of other BAAs. No, no, but the whole, the whole, the entire amount was calculated for the benefit of the others because the whole amount reflects the diversity benefit. Everybody's requirement reflects the diversity benefit. Okay, so the this diversity benefit reflects the fact we got all of that stuff across the the EIM. If you say that we're not going to let that be used except within the local area, then there's no diversity benefit. Okay, maybe there's a misunderstanding because the requirement that is shown there is the BAA requirement, not the global it's requirement. BAA minimum. It's the BAA well, the minimum. minimum reflect, but but with the diversity requirement, with and however much the import it can import. Yeah, the uh, diversity benefit is reflected in that requirement. It's an adjusted requirement that you reduce it by any the mother elasticity or imports or so it's whatever is remaining that has to be met by internal resources. There's no other way. Right. And it's reduced by the diversity benefit. So it's lower because of the diversity benefit. If we yeah. blocked off everybody else, they need a lot more than that. So just put yourself in the face of the other BAA. Their amount that they need locally is reduced because they got a diversity benefit that they can pull in from other BAAs. But if you put in a rule that, oh, we're going to block them off when there's mitigation, then there is no diversity benefit because it won't flow. Um, Scott, was there anything wrong with the example that I posed? Because that was clear that in the example that I mentioned, you allow an additional 50 megawatt of economic displacement if we limit to 160 instead of 110. That was clear to me. You I, I think, can I, this is Don again, so I think the argument that's being made is the fact, it's, yes, you're looking at from an import, this, that the BA that this rule is applying to is import constrained, but the neighboring balancing authority is not import constrained. So that, that BAA should still be able to get FRU from another BAA. No, it is. The reason why they're both in the same bubble is because they're both import constrained. Well, no, the, the region is import constrained. Right. It may not be import constrained between the two balancing authorities within the bubble. Right, but once you put on an export constraint, now, there's, now it's import constrained. I, I agree with Doug. The input constraint is on the region. The fact that we put an export constraint on that BAA, that doesn't mean the other BAA has an input constraint. There could be more BAAs in that region. No, but, but, but the reason we're triggering there, take your little example that we just went through on page 9. If you, if you go back in there and there's BAA 2 and BAA 4, and you got the, there behind this constraint, so there's two BAAs there. If you block off all the flexi ramp from BAA 4, 
and, and you didn't put any in BEA2 because you could import from BEA4, then BEA2 stuck with no flexible capacity, and you won't let it come in from BEA4 at any price. Scott, we allow uh, wheel throughs, but if there are BEA2 that are in there, there's, there's, no, there's no wheel through. No, no, but I mean, let's say that I'm looking on the right side, which is the market run, okay? And we have a net EIM transfer constraint that limits the net export of BA to 200 megawatts, okay? And there was no flexible RAM in this example here, but let's say that there is uncertainty that materializes in RTD after this FMM. Right. And BA1 needs uh, flexible RAM capacity to be deployed as energy to... But suppose there's just BEA2 and BEA4. Just two of them... Uh, okay, I'm, the I'm working with this example. What I'm trying to say is that BEA1 can still get energy from BEA4 because it will still be BEA2 even if we have a constraint for right, BEA2. but BEA2 can't. Sorry? But BEA2 can't. For BEA2, we have made sure that the export allows for the capacity that needs to be procured locally to meet their own requirements. Yeah, okay. But... If there's, if there's only two of them in there, suppose there's just BAA2 and BAA1, then, you know, that's what I'm trying to get at. If there's just BAA2 and BAA1, or just BA4 and BA2, then when you put in the constraint, one of them ends up with, no, you know, potentially no available to flexible capacity. Yeah, if we have a radial connection on, of EIM entities, that may be a problem, Scott, but... But that's what we're talking about when we get these... these we're, this whole example is about the situation where you've got a couple of BAEMEs behind the same constraint. Right, but... Uh, That's what triggers the, the whole mitigation. But in our network, everything is masked, so there are, there are ways of getting the flex RAM capacity from any BAA on the grid because there are paths that can go through a BAA that has that constraint. It allows wheel through. I, I mean, I, we didn't see any problem with this. But I, this is Don. So, but I do think if you construct this example, let's throw out BAA4 from this mm -hmm. example. And you, BA2 is the only one that's enforcing the rule. If we awarded and then BA2 doesn't have sufficient import capability to meet its uh, internal uncertainty requirement for FRP, then you would not make that full FRP that you're holding in BA2 available to serve BA ones in the event that uncertainty materialized there, and that's what you're arguing is the sharing of the flexible ramping uh, is for the total quantity because everyone's everyone is assuming that it's the import cap if you have the import capability you can get it from the other VA. Right. I mean, if there's if this was such that you could get the capacity in from another direction, then we wouldn't you know there'd be other supply coming in at the competitive LMP. The reason it's, it's going to be constrained off and we're going to trigger mitigation is you can't bring it in over another path. You know, this is, the mitigation is going to trigger precisely when you're in a situation where there's going to be a very small number of, of BAAs behind the constraint. Because as you pointed out, it won't trigger just because there's a, a constraint between, you know, uh, just because the, the interface between two BAAs is, is, is loaded up. If you've got another path, you know, we'll, we'll make use of the other path. So it's going to be when there's no other path that we're going to trigger the local market power mitigation. And I'm concerned particularly in RTD about what's going to happen when we put that in and then the real-time dispatch is different from what was in the advisory dispatch and we've got a constraint that the flexor ramp isn't going to be available at any price. And I think that's got potential to have, have very high prices and, and take away some of the EIM benefit in a way that we aren't really, uh, was, wasn't the intention. So could this be illustrated with the, the simple example on slides five and seven? Not, not here now on the fly, but can we work that through and clarify what's at stake and what the issue is with, with that offline? Yeah, I, I think we can. I think, again, the simple example is just throw BA4 out of this example and you can see it okay. actually uh, Occurring okay. to where the fact that BA2, it, remember the diversity benefit comes from being from having import capability, and so the fact that BA2 doesn't have a lot of import capability, that means it can't fully capture the whole diversity benefit. But that doesn't mean that it can then prevent BA1 from capturing its full diversity benefit, which is right. But if you structure the example 
in a way that all your import capability is coming from one BAA, and that BAA is the one that's enforcing the rule, then you have an unrealistic scenario. That's not the way our EIM grid is composed of. We have mesh network between the EIM entities, so there's always another EIM entity that can provide on a parallel path. So I'm saying but if still, that were true, you wouldn't have congestion, we wouldn't trigger local market power mitigation. No, the congestion is on a bigger region that maybe several BAAs are in okay, it. If, if, we have, if we have a big enough area, but then if, if we have such a big area that we've got all this flex coming in, again, why are we triggering local market power mitigation? So the basic point is, is that, uh, Scott, you're saying this constraint is making things unnecessarily tight. There may be other ways to get the power in, as George suggests, but it's going to be more expensive. And, well, or I'm worried about when there isn't, when we get a, yeah. when we get a little nested area where there isn't. It, and I'm particularly worried in, in RTD. It's a concern. I think it's a concern when there's really two VAs in a bubble themselves and one's enforced this or, way. Or, yeah, two or three or small. But I think small, even I, a small BAA, maybe, maybe there's three, but they're, they aren't real. Okay, so we're, uh, let's work on this some more offline. Uh, do we have any more comments in the room or uh, on any questions online? Okay, so I think we're going to go to my brief technical footnote on these examples here. So, uh, So, hi, I'm, I'm Ben Hobbs, Chair, and this is on a technical issue. This is more of a footnote. Um, and this is a specific case of something that happens, can happen in our markets very easily when you have an initial run with some result, and then you define another constraint based on that initial run you wind up with a mathematical condition called degeneracy pretty often that does some funny things with prices. I just want to point this out and a solution to this. It's actually a solution the ISO has used with degeneracy in other cases. And by the way, degeneracy is a technical mathematical term. It's not something that's, it's not as much fun as it sounds. Um, so this is, so I've provided all the information here. You can duplicate my examples. I am not gonna go through um, the, the all the assumptions and detail and so forth. I just want to highlight that with this example, that if I make some assumptions that are consistent with that example, with the numbers you saw there, so I make some specific load and supply as, as supply curve assumptions, the result will be the solutions you see on slides five and seven for these two regions. But what actually happens, it turns out that with that right hand, the market solution, the market run solution, because of this mathematical condition called degeneracy, there are actually, is actually more than one set of market prices that are consistent with that. And which market prices are reported by the market software, um, I suppose it can be predicted, but either of them are quote unquote correct. This is the mathematical condition called degeneracy. So uh, there are two sets of prices. One is um, P, uh, either, both of them have P1 equal $50, but either P2 equal to 70 or 100 will work, and then you get different transfer shadow prices. What's going on is that you've, you've got this sub step supply curve, and then you've posed another constraint that falls exactly on one of those steps. So it turns out that either price on that step, the lower price of uh, 70 or the higher price of 100 would, um, it could be reported by the market software or actually anything in between, 85.3, for example. Um, so the way that mathematicians and the way the ISO has solved this in other circumstances is you do something called permutation. You slightly change the right-hand side of the constraint, add an epsilon, and you get one of the two solutions. And in this case, what happens if you relax the transfer constraint just a little bit, add a megawatt, add 10 megawatts, um, some small amount, then you get solution one in this case. You get the lower price for P2, which also gives you the lower price for the transfer shadow price. 
And so a, a question I could ask, if it's arbitrary which one of these two you have, is there one that you would prefer? And I would say that, well, um, everything else being equal, we'd probably prefer the pricing solution that has a lower shadow price on the transfer constraint, and that distorts the overall LMPs less. There might be other reasons to choose one over the other, but this is not just academic. Uh, you know, the difference between a 70 and a $100 price is making a difference in some folks' settlements, right? Solution one is cheaper for consumers, but there's less revenue for producers. I suppose if P2 is a vertically integrated utility, it might not matter terribly much. Uh, but, it, but this also means that the prices aren't as predictable. Now, by the way, uh, in the constraint, if you um, increase the 300 or something more than that because you have this uh, flexi ramp up that we've added to it in the, in, the, uh, in the formula that Elliot showed and what we've been just talking about, then you will get solution number one. This also happens here. It's, it's just a problem that's going to occur all the time, that if you set the transfer constraint at exactly the, the, these flows that you're getting in the mitigation run, you will get, in general, multiple prices. And so here's a set of data consistent with the, the, the four BAA example, which, by the way, is due to DIM, DMM first, right? I think DMM was the first one to cook up this, so giving credit where credit is due. Um, if you stick these four supply curves, the four BAAs, plus those four loads, you will get the solution uh, on the left and then on the right. And then once again, we have two sets of prices that are consistent with the market run. Um, one set is the set that, that Elliot showed, which is solution two, which has a price of 31 in P2 and a, um, a higher price in P4 and P1. But it turns out that the first solution is also consistent with that, that prices of 36 in P1, P2, and P4 are all consistent with that. And then you get a zero transfer shadow price. So I'll ask the question again, do we prefer one of these sets of prices over the other? Exactly the same schedule, two sets of prices, and uh, you might argue that, well, we would rather have a lower price on the transfer constraint um, uh, that might, you might say that means less distortion in the, in the LMPs. Um, and you can guarantee that by, again, um, uh, permuting the right-hand side, just adding a little bit a, a, a smidgen to the right-hand side there. So the, in summary, this mathematical condition called the degeneracy is likely if the transfer economic displacement constraint is set precisely equal to the flows in the mitigation run. That may not actually happen very often because of um, the availability of uh, flexible ramp upwards. But if that's the case, you know, which set of prices you get you might not be able to predict and which one you get will make a difference in the settlements. And you might have a reason to prefer one set of prices over the others. And I suggest just to be safe that in, um, in the formula that Elliot showed, add epsilon to the right-hand side, and that will likely result in a lower shadow price for that constraint and less distortion of LMPs, and maybe LMPs will be more predictable. Um, at any rate, all the data is there if you want to try to duplicate that, and I'll take any questions or any comments, if there are any. George. Uh, hi, Ben. Um, I just want to provide a level of comfort here that uh, the way you set it up, uh, indeed, you have a degenerate solution because it so happens that the transmission limit is uh, driving the single generator that has the, the bid exactly yeah. the So, okay. So your solution sits exactly at the break point of the energy bill, and that's what's causing the degeneracy. Now, the level of comfort I want to provide is that um, in our system, um, specifically for this scenario, there are other scenarios that we can have degenerate solutions, but specifically for this one, for this to happen, planets and stars have to align. I, I will explain why. Uh, the transfer, the net EIM transfer where the constraints apply to, uh, as you know, is the, the mismatch of the power balance constraint of the BAA, the right-hand side, if you will. 
And the power balance constraint has a model for marginal losses. We're using loss penalty factors for that. And these are numbers that they have five, six decimals. So it's extremely unlikely to get a bid divided by that loss penalty factor and find the optimal solution sitting exactly at the, at the break point on the energy bid. So I'm not saying it will never happen, but it's really improbable. Now, the, I'm not saying that we What that would mean then is that sometimes you'd be on the left side of the constraint, sometimes the right, you'd get somebody to right. the so, right. So actually, just by accounting for losses, you have a natural mechanism to resolve the degeneracy, and this usually happens in every constraint out there. Now, there are cases that we have seen degeneracy, and uh, probably, I don't know, maybe um, um, we, we can get into that discussion, and there is a methodology that uh, our vendor has implemented to resolve those. Um, that methodology has not particularly been applied to this case, but I don't know if this is necessary. I think you asked the question in your first slide, do we care? Um, I think this is not one of those that we would care about, but uh, theoretically speaking, there's always a possibility of degeneracy, and for general uh, constraints, we, we do, um, we, we are concerned about that, and we do have solutions for it. And this concludes my footnote, and I think we can go back. I think, Brittany, you're on next. If there are no other comments, anybody on, on the phones? No. Okay, George, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I should, so I should add, so we shouldn't be surprised then when we actually implement this that often we'll have zero price on that constraints where we'll fall on the left side. I mean, that's basically what happens between the two solutions. When you get that $5 price that it we should saw, but if it, a slight change will give you $0 price. So um, we'll see if that prediction is borne out. Well, uh, you see, after you change the, the bids from unmitigated to mitigated, your next market solution can, can be completely different. You can, you can have a different commitment. So it's like, uh, yeah, you, you, you could have a completely different situation. Are there any questions on the phone? Okay. So we're going to move to the third element of our proposal. Oh, excuse me. Oh, we got a question. Okay. Operator, can you put the question through, please? I'm sorry. The person does not want to ask a question anymore. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll move forward to the hydro default energy bid. So through our discussions with stakeholder and MSC, we have come to the conclusion with all of these that hydro resources are unlike most resources that are participating in the CAISO market as well as the energy imbalance market. And this is generally due to their have to make decisions based to generate based on opportunity cost of water as well as some water flow considerations. They also have to consider their local regulatory um, regulations that they have to comply with. This can lead to them self-scheduling into our market as well as um, not reducing their partic participation in our market. And we don't want that to happen because most hydro resources um, are fast ramping and are highly effective at meeting ramping needs that we need to maintain reliability to our grid. In addition to these considerations, they also have some fairly complex opportunity cost calculations. They have models with hundreds of inputs that may be used to determine these, which then implements what price they would use to deplete their water or willing to deplete their water at, as well as some env environmental restrictions, the minimum flow requirements, downstream flow requirements, and spill probability. These outputs for the opportunity cost can vary within the day, within the hour. And as well, certain resources will be price takers during some of those intervals. And it's also important to note that hydro resources may be operated primarily to meet water needs and then secondly operated to generate those energy needs. And it would be unreasonable for the CAISO to recalculate these or revamp these models and calculations and duplicate what they would come up for their opportunity costs especially since the default energy bid is a fixed price over the day. So what we've done um, is we have created a standard transparent 
default energy bid for hydro resources. It's the same concept that we had for the revised draw proposal, but uh, shown here in the calculation a little differently. We have a gas component, the short-term component, which we're calling here the local floor, the long-term component, which we're calling the geographical floor. The gas floor is representing the opportunity cost for a hydro resource to substitute, or for hydro generator to substitute the peak resource of a gas resource for their energy times the gas price index rate, and then times a 1.1 multiplier, which is a standard multiplier that we use for our gas resources in developing their default energy bids. The short-term component, which is our local floor, it is represented here as the max of the day ahead index, the balance of the month index, and the month ahead, month, excuse me, month ahead index time and multiplier. We are, um, this is used to represent local prices for the energy imbalance mar market, kind of a rough, rough proxy. As far as the multiplier, we are doing, we're proposing a 1.4 to ensure those, those default energy bids are not higher than those local energy imbalance market prices too frequently, so they're not being dispatched inefficiently or depleting their water uh, way too earlier in the day. As far as how we came up for the 1.4 multiplier, Danielle will discuss that here in a moment. For the long-term component, this is representing the opportunity to sell energy outside of their geographic area, and this would be done through a consultative process. So there are parts of this calculation that are customizable, and two of them are the maximum storage horizon, which would be required for each resource to show um, whether the amount of time that resource could stow, store energy for a, for a future potential sale, and this we believe to be a static input not changing. This would also inform in the equation the number of monthly futures that is being used, and then we would have a minimum for this to be one month and a maximum of 12 months. Hey, can, we, can we go back to the, uh, the formulas? I just want to clarify a couple of things I was thinking might be confusing to people. Okay. So on the, uh, this is Brad at ISO, the, um, the, looking down at the, uh, the uh, explanation of the various variables, it says uh, day ahead index, that's day ahead index, uh, day ahead peak price at the local trading hub. That's, that's describing for the for the local floor, and the geographic floor, we called that the geographic floor, but that that name is a little bit confusing. I I think it should be more the um, it's the geographic floor, but it's also the long term floor. So if you if you have um, if you have transmission or a resource owner has transmission to another area that that day ahead index and the uh, month ahead index, those are the indexes at the uh, remote geographic locations, right? right. Or, or a, uh, a weighted average if your um, transmission doesn't support the whole output of your resource. Right, and yeah. a resource could have different hubs that's a local component versus the geographic yeah. component. Yeah, okay. This is Callie Wells for the Western Power Trading Forum. Just real quick, it just occurred to me. So the gas price index that you have in this formulation, um, I know it says for the specific resource, but we're talking hydro resources. Um, we're talking hydro resources in the EIM. So which gas price index are we using? We're using the gas price, the gas price index for the uh, Cali. So fuel region in which the uh, hydro resource is located. Okay, so, the, and I understand that for the resources in the California ISO, but what about EIM resources? Same thing, we have fuel regions for EIM. So the specific EIM fuel regions, okay. Just yeah. wanted to make sure. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, you know, for example, uh, Northwest resources would likely be the, what is it, I think it's the Sumas gas price region, or, mm -hmm. you know, for example. Okay, so going back to the term. So like Brad was alert, uh, alluding to, we have those bilateral hubs 
which um, we will map default hubs to the, based on where they're located, but they will have, uh, the resources will have the opportunity to select multiple hubs as long as they can prove that they have firm transmission rights during the, that time of the year. And this would be established through a consultative process with the ISO. Both of these inputs would impact the long-term component or the geographical component that we've been calling it. This, uh, as I mentioned, these resources would be, or resources would be assigned to a default energy bid hub for this particular resource area it, in the box here it's showing where their default hub would be. So PacWest, Portland, PowerX, and Puget Sound would be Mid-Sea or Mid-Columbia, Arizona, Idaho, Pacific East, and NB Energy would be Palo Verde. Northern California would be NP15 or north of Pass 15. Uh, Southern California would be the um, SP15 or south of Pass 15. Brittany, what sort of a process would there be for adjusting or adding uh, hubs to this, uh, adding default hubs? Uh, this, this wouldn't be locked into the tariff, right? This would be a PPM sort of a thing. I, yeah, I don't know that we... Well, we haven't... We, we haven't fully decided yet what's in the tariff and what's in the BPM. You know, that's the next step when we get into the tariff uh, language. Um, the, I think these would be, these are based on our, uh, you know, assessment of what the liquid hubs are today with the exception that we don't have listed um, Alberta because we were still looking at that. Um, I. I would anticipate they would be relatively static. You know, obviously we would update things as things change. But, you know, these are the... Uh, right, right. Um, okay. Um, because, of course, it may be resources that are far from any, any of these, and it's and this could have some implications for them. Right. In that case, they could propose some other ones, but yeah. still... Well, and this input is the consultative process that would be with the ISO, so that would all have to be demonstrated that they have transmission rights to wherever the hubs they would also like to be. So they could have multiple hubs, um, and we're proposing that they would re they would receive the maximum price for multiple hubs, and that would be calculated um, every day. Well, that's that's yeah, but that's not confused. The multiple hubs, the multiple hubs are if you have transmission to another location. This is the the, the if this is for these default hubs are for a resource that the owner has no transmission. Yeah, they're, they're mapped to one hub. But that's a good point, Ben, and, and maybe that's something we need to think about is to allow for um, uh, more custom hubs for resources that don't fit into uh, these standard hubs. I, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, and does, yeah. I mean, think of suppose public service of Colorado joined, and they're not really close to any of these, and they might be able to buy firm transmission to one or the other, or, or just non-firm. And uh, it is, a, I think, it's going to be. It, it is sort of complicated to uh, right to say where people. This is clean for the people that are located at these hubs. It gets very unclean for people that are located elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. We would have to have some kind of change as EIM and our markets expand. Are there any questions on the phone? Okay. One question. Okay. Caller, please go ahead and unmute Hi, this is Leah Fisher with Seattle City Light. I just had a question back on slide 14. Uh, so okay. my question is, on the, on the maximum storage horizon, um, third point, it says storage is bound below by one month. Um, so my question here is that, if Kaisa's latest proposal, my understanding was that um, Kaisa wasn't specifically um, limiting it to one month, but it was just um, stating that these resources would have to have the ability to store water, run or not run at different times of the day, and respond to dispatch instructions from the Kaisa. So that was sort of the standard that would have to be met. It wouldn't necessarily have to be one month of storage. So can you clarify um, what's on the slide here then in light of that? I think we're just yeah, trying to I, give a range. Yeah, no, what we're saying is you're correct that you don't have to have um, one month of storage. If you had less than one month of storage, then you would get the, um, then we would put in 
one month for you. You know, you would, you, your, your dev would, would, uh, for, like for the local floor, it would be the day ahead index, balance a month, and then the month ahead index. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Okay, thanks for the question. And with that, I'll turn it over to Danielle to explain the analysis we did. Okay. And um, we had a, a suggestion by email that we, we might have a, a break between topics to stretch, so we will do that. Like stretch now or? No, no. <laughs> when, we're through, when we're through with this, so. Here's an incentive to be brief with uh, questions. Okay. Uh, thanks, Danielle. Of course. Um, all right, thanks, Whitney. So as mentioned, we've performed some analysis regarding the new proposed default energy bid, and I wanted to take this time to discuss some of the results and explain them, but also note that additional results have been published in the draft final proposal. Um, so for this analysis, we calculated a default energy bid for each day during October 2017 through um, September of 2018, and we used the following steps to determine the appropriate multiplier for the local term component um, or the short term component for the proposed DEB. So we calculated the DEB first using the actual EIM prices for Pacific Core East with the bilateral hub prices at the Palo Verde Trading Hub and gas price index values at the Kern Hub. For calculating the DEB using EIM prices at PAC West and Puget Sound, we use the bilateral hub prices at Mid-Columbia and the gas price index values at the Sumas Hub. And then month ahead indices for this analysis were considered for resources with a three month storage horizon. We then compared the DEB, the calculated DEBs to the real time prices in each of the three respective EIM areas and then determined the percentage of intervals that a resource would be dispatched if fitting into the market at these calculated DEBs with the various scalars or multipliers applied to the local term component of the formula. So this analysis focused on a resource with a particular amount of storage being dispatched less than that amount during approximately 95 to 99% of intervals during the entire time period analyzed. And in the next three slides, we'll get into the results. And based on these results, we've determined that a 1.4 multiplier would be appropriate for a hydro resource, assuming this resource had four hours of available energy to utilize per day. And then I did want to mention that for the purpose of this analysis, we were only considering that the resource had firm transmission to one hub only, so no firm transmission to any other location besides the one specific default hub. So this table depicts the results of the analysis based on the Pacific Core East prices. On the top row of this table, we have the resources generation capability in hours per day. And on the far left column, shaded in darker blue, we have the various scalars that were used during this analysis. For example, a 120% scalar or multiplier means that the local component of the proposed DEB formula was multiplied by 1.2. So the results indicate that if a resource only had generation capability of four hours a day and a 1.4 scalar was applied, then this resource would be dispatched less than their defined availability during 95% of the intervals throughout the entire year of the analysis. Danielle, can you just yep. comment on why four hours? I think we took a look originally at replicating some of the analysis that PowerX had published um, towards the beginning of this initiative, and four hours seemed to be, or two, four, six, and eight seemed to be a reasonable way to compare results. Yeah, the, the four hours in the, you know, remember the point of this is to come up with um, one dev that covers all hydro resources, and they, you know, obviously they all, all have different limitations. In the, in the stakeholder 
process, it, there seemed to be a consensus that four hours was a reasonable number that reflected the, the daily limitations that most hydro resources can, can encounter. Cal. This is Kelly Wells with WPTF again. Um, following up on that um, point, did you guys have any insights into um, how many resources actually have the four-hour duration? Because I'm looking at the ones with two, hour, or two hours per day, and if you base it on that, you'd obviously come up with a different multiplier. So I think following up why four hours, do well, we know I, for the breakdown I, I, of resources? I should add on that, that you know, what people have pointed out in the stakeholder process is that the, these limits, it's not like a resource you know, has a, a four-hour limitation every day. You know, people have people have pointed out that these limitations for the daily limitations vary for a variety of factors, and you know, they can they can you know, a resource might have 12 hours one day. It might have it might have two hours one day. So this isn't based on any. This isn't. This is more based on anecdotal evidence and and uh, you know. Uh, people's agreement that, that four hours is just a, a reasonable uh, uh, surrogate for the, the limitations that a resource can encounter over over a day. I didn't follow that, Brad. I thought we were talking about a, a resource with opportunity cost. So you're saying it has to release four hours of water every day? No, it'd be limited to four hours per day. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, but wh why is it limited to four hours a day if it? You mean four hours on average a day? Is this four hours on average a day it's dispatched, or it's at most dispatched four hours a day? Are you talking about the analysis? Or just yeah, how, analysis. how we should think about this, yeah. Because I, I thought of it as an energy limitation, which would be more like an on average four right. hours a day. That means that, yeah, no, that, that's what I'm saying. So on average, the limitation is four hours per day, and then so our analysis then so this is looked at Dispatching it no more than four no, no, no. hours per day. Uh, no, no, no. That, but that's the. You mean no more than four hours a day, or an average of four hours a day? Because if it's got storage, then we should be looking at is it dispatched more than an average of four hours a day? Because if it's dispatched six on one day, it's dispatched two on the other. The whole point is it's got storage. It can it can balance that out. So it makes a big difference whether this is dispatched no more than four, in which case. You know, or right. an average of four. Because if it's no more than four, then maybe they're you know going to stay within their limits 99.999 percent of the time. Right. No, th this isn't this isn't based on long-term storage. This is based on resources have um, they have long-term storage, but then they also encounter short-term limitations throughout the day, where you know there's many days where a resource even with uh, long-term storage, you well, know, they have no be. opportunity costs because they've got. I mean, they've got some sort of short-term. I, I don't. Sure, this, during this a particular day, short-term limit. During not a long-term. Yeah, this uh, during okay. a particular uh, a resource with long-term opportunity costs during any particular day, they can. Yeah, have short-term limit. Not a long-term opportunity cost. This should be a short-term opportunity cost. Then. Yes, yes, yeah. that's what this is. The the, the short-term opportunity to cost yeah. over the day. The the. Uh, the the uh, you know the other components are designed to capture long term opportunity costs. That would be the um, the what we're calling the uh, geographic floor component, which is probably more importantly, it is geographic floor because that's where we bring in the remote the, hubs. The, 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 the price for that day, right? Because it's an opportunity. It's how much they they can't deplete more than that on that day, so it should be based on the value on that day, right? Not some long-term price, but well, this, it's that's why this is the um, this that's why this is the the day ahead, the balance of the month okay, or okay. the month. So the, that's that's the only thing this okay. this okay. applies to. Okay, so if we move on, we see very similar results based on the Pacific Core West prices analysis, and um, so we see that if a 1.4 multiplier is applied to the local component of the formula that, to a resource with only four hours of generation capability, this resource would be dispatched less than their defined availability 90, during 99% of intervals throughout the entire year of the analysis. 
And moving on to the last slide, the results for Puget Sound Energy almost exactly mimic what we see from Pacificor West. Um, so the 1.4 scalar, scalar, excuse me, um, gets you to that 99 percentile. And I think in summary, all of these three tables indicate that a, a resource has the 1.4 scalar applied to the local component of the proposed formula, then the result would be a value higher than the real-time prices during the range of 95 to 99% of intervals for the specific representative resource that we've used in the analysis. Any additional questions before I hand it over to Brittany? This is also, I think this analysis is conservative, isn't it? Because you assume they were mitigating every hour? Correct. Right. So it would actually be a lower, that it would dispatch less often than this. Yes. Okay. Um, any, any, yeah, any, any questions? Let's check on the phones for questions on the, nothing on the dead. Well, uh, so I, I wanted to, you're going to go to the, more on the DEB or the reference level adjustments? Let's go back, to, let's go back to the DEB formulations. Really talk much about, uh, um, there's a big issue with yes. um, the geographic, uh, the, ge the geo floor and uh, yeah. transmission costs and so forth, and in general, we we have some concerns about that. That the idea of just uh, using the highest of indices at several points, in a sense, we're assuming that, that's assuming that they have some uh, use it or lose it transmission rights that have no otherwise no value. And so they would get the, you know, wherever they could sell it for the highest energy prices is, is the value. But if, in fact, a transmission right could be sold, bought or sold, um, or if they're, they've used all the rights, then it would not be correct to use the, uh, their opportunity cost would not be the highest price among all the possible markets because there's also a cost in accessing that market. And I don't know if any colleagues want it expand further on that point. It's something that we'll, we'll talk about in the opinion. So that's, that, that's just one thing that we have a concern about. Yeah, so I'd phrase it as, you know, so, so say the mid-sea hub is always, uh, you know, you can't, you can't get out of mid-sea and there's plenty of generation, so the, the, the mid-sea hub is always, say it's always $10. And someone has and someone has transmission to Palo Verde, and the uh, the the summer price in Palo Verde is uh, is a uh, hundred dollars, and so uh, uh, so say they want to argue they want to they want to uh, save their uh, use of their resource so they can sell in the summer at Palo Verde at a hundred dollars, so there's. Uh, you know, so theoretically, what they should be able to do is uh, save their resource, or I guess they don't even need to save their resource uh, for, for the summer when it's hundred dollars. They can just they can just buy it Palo Verde at um, ten dollars, and then use their transmit. You'll buy bilaterally at Palo Verde at ten dollars. Use their or excuse me, buy at Mid C at ten dollars. Use their transmission. Sell at Palo Verde at 100. Uh, the reason we put in this this geographic floor was uh, market participants have have made the uh, argument that, well, theoretically that's right, but uh, in practice we can't always uh, easily uh, buy just in a specific hour at mid C. We got to buy a block of power for the whole day. Uh, when we just want to deliver Palo Verde in, in, in the one hour. And then they've also said, you know, these are clean hydro resources and, you know, the sales opportunities for, for power for clean hydro resources are a lot more than just generic unspecified power you know, because of the greenhouse gas costs. And, you know, they want to market the power linked to the output of their generation. So that, that was our rationale of, of putting in the geographic floor where, you know, I can understand, though, on the flip side, there's the argument that, you know, in the ISO market, 
where you have CRRs, you know, if you have a resource that's in a, uh, NP15 and NP15 prices are $10, and if they were uh, $100 SP15, we don't calculate your opportunity cost based on the $100. You, we, are, we calculate your opportunity cost based on the $10, and you get a CRR to protect your your price spread relative to the $100. Um, to me, it's kind of this kind of a a seams issue though between between the, the bilateral market and our market because in the EIM situation is that they do have they do have that firm transmission and they, they can sell outside of the EIM and and, and the, the the market might not be as liquid to make the to make people you know do what theory says that they can just buy at their local hub and then and then sell uh, and theory would also say that well there's somebody else that would pay them for that right so right. they could realize it that way but could be that the market is entirely illiquid so they've got this right that other that it's only worth something to them and to nobody else if it's so illiquid but that's a strong okay, well, high hurdle sub prices if they're so illiquid yeah uh, you know that's one question the second question is oh, sorry, you know scott can you repeat that i can hear you. if the hub prices are so if the hubs are so illiquid you can't buy and sell power at those prices why are we using the prices for mitigation you know, the, the second point is if there is a, a, a clean premium that's a clean premium it has nothing to do with the difference in prices between two hubs when there's congestion. You know, there might be a $90 spread in the prices, but there's a $3 clean premium. So, you know, if there's a clean premium, we should be putting that on top of these prices. Or if, if it's hydro and there's a there's a premium for it, then, and, the, and the, the hub prices are for coal, and you can sell it for a premium, yeah, then maybe you could, uh, but then we wouldn't be using the hub price because that doesn't reflect the premium either. The other thing that we ought to keep in mind is, just because you have one megawatt of firm transmission between two places doesn't mean that that's your marginal, you know, that you, you can sell your marginal megawatt of energy at the other location. Because you may, you may have enough energy to fill up that firm transmission on that day regardless. It doesn't mean that at the, at the margin you need to save another megawatt in order to have it available. So this is a lot more complicated than uh, it seems to me than just looking at the availability of firm transmission. I yeah I was gonna I, I was thinking of an analogy which I may regret but so uh, imagine that y you own an aluminum smelter and you generate electricity you can take that local electricity and turn it into aluminum and sell it someplace um, and this seems like saying that's our opportunity cost sort of our ability to turn it into this other product in another place. Um, where the value of the electricity is actually, the, the, if we do think it's a liquid hub, it's it's the value there. Now, where Ben was going, sort of like, okay, well, how how um, transferable really is that sort of ability uh, to sell off that that markup, which may not be necessarily even the liquidity of the hub, but it may be the the ability to the liquidity of the transmission rights themselves, I guess. Um, but but I'd have to. But for the aluminum smelter analogy. We've, for demand response, we've said, you know, your cost of foregoing producing aluminum is the opportunity cost you can bid into the market. Buy somebody's power to produce aluminum instead of using your own. Not trying to quantify the value of aluminum, right? We're just going to let the market reveal. Reveal that value. Yeah, my point being that I, I, if the if the transmission rights were fully sort of liquid and transferable, I don't think there's a, a big difference between uh, electricity in a different place and converting that electricity into a product that you can ship to a different place. Uh, in terms of how we think about the opportunity cost of electricity at a given place in time versus all this other stuff. And, you know, there's this point that people aren't necessarily located at these hubs. So we're, on the one hand, we don't think that the firm transmission just moves you from mid-sea to Palo Verde. It's just because you're somewhat close to, to mid-sea geographically doesn't mean you're on the same side of the transmission constraint. So maybe for somebody, even though they might be geographically close to mid-sea, maybe Palo Verde is the right price, even if they don't have firm transmission. You know, it just you know, it's it's a market definition question that isn't isn't really resolved. Yeah, let's let's not confuse the the 
the, the local hub component versus the um, these geographic hub components. Would we? I think we could use a little bit more definition of our local hub. We said closest. I don't. I think we meant electrically closest. You know, something more representative of the prices, not. The close might not mean that might not be where the transmission constraint is. I might be electrically close to mid sea, but I'm on the other side of the transmission constraint. So market wise, I'm much closer to Palo Verde. Yeah, so we we could define that better, saying the hub is most representative of their prices. Yeah. Uh, we have two questions or comments on the phones. Operator. Uh, caller, go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi. Good afternoon. It's Mark Holman with PowerX. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So I think this is an, uh, an interesting topic, and I think it's very worthwhile uh, to provide a, a couple examples and walk through this, because we feel the geographic hub locations is an essential component of making this work for, uh, certainly for Northwest Hydro. And so the first example, the first point I wanted to make is that, unfortunately, there is limited amount of data out there. So we only have a limited number of trading hubs. And the forward prices at these trading hubs are reflecting 16-hour blocks for the whole month. And so these hubs are a proxy, and unfortunately the best proxy available, but not a great proxy, for forward opportunities and future spot market opportunities to make sales. But, of course, a hydro resource with transmission rights can make sales at the location of its transmission rights in the best hours on the best days and can do much better than simply selling at the forward prices represented by these hubs. In terms of geographic location, I'll give you two examples that I think highlights the importance of, of including the max function and these trading hubs. So the first example I'll use is for us, we can connect, we connect both to Mid-Sea and to Alberta, and in effect we are between Mid-Sea and Alberta. And we have transmission rights to get to, um, to and from Alberta, and we have transmission rights to get to and from Mid-Sea. If Alberta prices are high, we will naturally be importing from Mid-Sea and selling to Alberta. And if water is depleted, you will generally displace, in that case, a sale to the higher price market in Alberta. Taking away water reduces my ability to make that marginal sale to Alberta. The opposite is true when mid-sea is the higher priced market. We'll naturally be importing from Alberta, generating both using the imported power to serve our load as well as residual water and selling at mid-sea. And if you deplete water from the resource, you will reduce the ability to make those future sales at mid-sea. So the higher of concept is what we actually experience in practice when we look at the two different geographic locations. We'll move the water to the higher price market because we're in between those two hubs. We have connectivity to the two hubs. And if you deplete water, you will reduce at the margin, a marginal sale to the higher priced market opportunity. Now the next one is where it kind of goes into the topic you're touching on, which is this, is transmission something that can be separated, i.e. it's really CRR value and doesn't belong in the DEB, or is it something that's bundled with the hydro resource and in fact, that the hydro resource and the transmission are bundled together and it is an important factor in the DEB. And so I'll use the, our example of we connect to Mid-Sea, but we also connect to California at Cobb and Knob and at Silmar, and those locations are more remote than Mid-Sea, so they're further away. Now, when we look at these forward prices, we're looking at, in many cases, monthly prices for the whole on-peak period. So it's understating the actual sales opportunity because we have a hydro resource with transmission to get to that location. It is a bundled product of transmission with generation where we're selling clean energy in the highest price hours on the highest price days at those locations. The transmission is path specific. It does not look or act at all like a CRR. It goes from the BCUS border to those locations. If you deplete water, and we're no longer able to make those hourly sales, let's say in future months, in the morning and evening peak, 
at Kaaba Knob from our hydro resource. It is not easy and it is highly costly to try to use those transmission rights to, for example, buy mid-sea supply to deliver it to serve those sales for numerous reasons. First of all, buying supply at mid-sea, well, that's not on the path that you purchase. So you're gonna, in most cases, need to acquire new transmission to connect the mid-sea supply to your transmission rights to get to California. Secondly, the mid-sea supply is going to not be clean hydro supply, so you're gonna incur carbon costs. And the third and fourth points are critical. The third point is you're gonna be buying 16-hour block energy, and so what may have been economic sales from your hydro resources to sell morning and evening peak, now you've bought 16-hour energy and you may be losing money by trying to make those sales at Cobb and Knob because now you need to sell all 16 hours. And the fourth point is when you make those sales, customers are often requiring you to specify that it's coming from hydro or coming from a specific resource. So if you deplete the water, you cannot just go out and buy a different resource, even if you buy additional transmission, buy the full 16 hour block and purchase carbon allowances for the difference and deliver that to those customers. So while there may be some limited opportunities to resell the transmission, if there's a very big spread, and I think that's a valid point that there is some limited opportunities for that, or there may be some limited opportunities to go and buy replacement supply if your supply is depleted. We also need to recognize that it generally acts as a bundled product, path specific, and that these hub prices understate the value because you're able to sell the morning and evening peaks or the best hours on the best days. And I think the KISO has come up with a well-balanced proposal to try to reflect that given the limitations on the data available. In one way, it may overstate the value because as you point out, there may be some residual value to the transmission if the resource is depleted. But on the other hand, it understates the value because it doesn't reflect that you can sell the best hours and the best uh, uh, days in those locations. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, and, and um, of course, uh, during the morning and evening peaks is when there would be the highest value. So um, using an index on 16 hours will understate that. But on the other hand, the marginal of the foregone sale may not be, you may be selling as much as you can in terms of uh, transmission rights or other limitations during those peaks. And it could be that the marginal uh, sale would actually be at, at some other time, but of course that's that's not something that we can predict with uh, with certainty. So as you point out, this is all very rough. Uh, we have somebody else on the line. Uh, yes, we do. Caller, go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi, this is Leah Fisher with Seattle City Light. Um, I just like to offer support. Um, with what Mark just said, we agree with a lot of the statements made there, and uh, my colleague who's on a different line may jump in and weigh in with some further thoughts there. But I did have one question that I think will probably be a simple clarification um, on slide 13. So my understanding of this latest proposal was that um, all resources, both short-term storage and long-term storage hydro, would have access to the multiple trading hubs. But it, it may just be getting caught up on nomenclature, but in looking at the formulas on the slide, looking at the local floor and the geographic floor, it gets a little bit confusing. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure out if the formula for the local floor, which is essentially the proxy for the short-term storage resource, would also have access to multiple geographic trading hubs. Can you clarify that point for me, please? Yeah, this is Brad. I'd have to look back at the uh, our written proposal to see exactly how we implemented that. I, I think the, the the answer is yes, the, the, the short term would have access to multiple uh so I think it it would it would still go in the geo, it would still go in the uh geographic floor and then you would be limited to just the um the uh, month ahead index. It looks like in the geographic floor, it, it just says month ahead index plus one and is, and is missing the month ahead index. Right, yeah, that's my concern. I think that may be a typo, but we can, we can clarify that later. 
Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Leah, before you go, can I ask you a question? Maybe this is not, this will discourage people from asking questions, but um, where you're, uh, where City Lights assets are in the Skagit and elsewhere, they're west of the Cascades, and um, um, the, the value, when, when you have uh, uh, potential voltage issues in the Puget Sound area or other constraints, the value of power in the uh, west of the Cascades may be very different than uh, mid-sea, and I'm wondering whether that's uh, an issue for City Light as well, that uh, mid-sea may not be terribly good for you because um, where your assets are located are, are, are valuable for the Puget Sound pocket. I will do my best to weigh in on that. I'm not um, our power marketing representative. He may be able to call in and provide a little more clarity, but my understanding is most of our trading we do is at mid-sea, so we would think of that as a relevant trading hub for Seattle. Okay, yeah, that, that might be an isolated winter problem. I was just uh, just curious. Okay, thank you very much for calling in. We're done with sure. um, Okay. Okay. Um, we're, we're over time in terms of the agenda, so better go back to Brittany and we can wrap things up. Okay. Hopefully there's not a lot of questions for the reference level adjustments, but if there is, we're happy to talk about them. Um, we are – the whole reference level adjustment process came through the commitment cost and default energy bid policy that we established this reference level adjustment. We recognize that reference levels that were based on published prices did not always uh, or were not always accurate. So we created this reference level adjustment process where suppliers would be able to come to the ISO if their actual or expected costs were above their reference levels. And they would be able to do this by retaining sufficient justification, explaining why the need for their reference level adjust adjustment needed to be higher than what we calculated. We um, created this under the understanding that fitting up to a resource's reasonableness threshold, and this is the maximum amount the ISO would automatically verify a resource's request to pass through our before the market screening criteria. And was not a safe harbor, and that those adjustments had to be based on actual or expected costs. As we developed this policy, it was approved by the Board of Governors last early last year. There was other recent uh, gas volatility instances that came up that we realized we needed to look at our reference level adjustment process through local market power mitigation and propose some adjustments, which we've done. So for this purpose that we're talking about the real-time market for these slides. Uh, we are proposing to proactively update each morning the reasonableness thresholds used for the real-time market for same-day uh, or using same-day gas trading information that we observe on ICE. We would update a resource's reasonableness threshold if those uh, gas prices were greater than 10 percent compared to the gas price index used in the prior day. Uh, we would then um, then the other part to this is we recognize that some resources reasonableness thresholds may not get updated and to account for that, we would allow for uh, manual consultations for those resources. They could request a manual consultation with us if they have uh, seen that same day gas prices have been more than 10% or 15, 50 cents, whichever was highest compared to the gas price that was used in the prior day. Now, if the ISO were to receive multiple requests, we would have a way of updating the fuel region. So um, this would be done through what we observe on ICE or through the manual consultation process. If we receive a certain amount, and I think we talked about in the paper at least three, um, we would go ahead and update a resources fuel with the updated prices for the reference level adjustment. We would be using a weighted average if we received different prices from all those requests to come up with the price that we'd use for that fuel region. In CCW, we also proposed a 10 to 25 percent reasonableness threshold. We would no longer need the 25 percent for the premium on Mondays, but we would be retaining the 25 percent for days after a holiday. And that would be like we just had a holiday this week, so Tuesday would receive a premium of 25 percent for the reasonableness. 
threshold. For the day ahead, um, oh, did I pass that? Nope, JK, it's later. Uh, for the hydro resources, we recognize that the gas component in their default energy bid would need to be updated as prices may go up. We understand, though, that hydro resources wouldn't be able to meet our criteria to do the reference level adjustments since they're not necessarily purchasing gas, so they would not be able to provide those quotes to us. So to account for the instances that they need to have that gas component updated for their default, if a fuel region was updated prior for the manual consultations or for prices that we've observed on ICE, we would subsequently update a hydro resource who is using the same fuel region for the gas resources. So, for instance, if a hydro resource is mapped to Sumas and three other gas resources prior to or during the manual consultation process had their reference level adjustment approved for the Sumas region and that region was updated, the all of the hydro resource default energy bids that were mapped to the Sumas region would also have that gas component updated in their hydro default energy bid. We also recognize that there are resources that own both hydro and gas, so we would allow for them to come and have an annual consultation with the ISO and then have their uh, reasonableness threshold increased or reference level adjustment. For the day ahead market, we are proposing to um, proactively look at the day, the or to include the Monday only package that is included on ICE, and we would update reasonableness thresholds proactively for the day ahead market. Uh, same thing with day ahead, as we talked about real time, CCW allowed for a 10% or 25% reasonableness threshold. We would no longer need the 25 because of this proposal, but we would still be re retaining the 25 for days without holidays or a published index. So that is the remainder of our proposal. Um, do I have any questions? I have no questions at this time. Wonderful. So our uh, initiative schedule here today with the Market Surveillance Committee, we have stakeholder comments due next week, and then we would be presenting, or excuse me, and then we would uh, see the MSC opinion posted in sometime in late February. We would, of course, have our own uh, call with MSC to adopt the opinion and talk about the opinion with stakeholders, and then we would be presenting our final proposals to the AIM governing body first in, on March 12th, and then to the Board of Governors on March 28th, I believe it is. So that's our schedule for local market power mitigation. Um, any further comment or questions within the room? online from the committee. Um, if not, I'll thank uh, Brittany, Danielle, and Elliot. Thanks, thanks for uh, preparing and briefing us, being a discussion. We will now take the requested, uh, we, there was a pleading email saying, please, a five minute break. And I understand the need for that. So we're gonna take a five minute break now and then we'll pick up with the next item, the agenda. And uh, whoever sent that email, I thank you. It's a good idea. Probably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably too late, Scott says. <laughs> okay, see you in five minutes then. Operator, we're ready to get started. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. We're uh, um, we're at the last um, agenda item. We are scheduled to end at 3:30. It's possible we might run a few minutes over, but I swear we won't go past four. Um, Don Don Tress Way will be talking to us about the day ahead market enhancements and the flexible ramping product. Yeah, it's all yours. So good afternoon, everybody. So um, as you remember, we've split the day-ahead market enhancements initiative into two phases. The first is moving to 15-minute granularity. The second phase is introducing the flexible ramping product in the day-ahead market. Um, just to give everybody an update in terms of like a timeline, I'm hoping that we can go out with 
uh, another paper and stakeholder meeting the end of February, first week of March. We're still working with technology to determine if there are any uh, unit commitment simplifications we need to do to get the 15-minute granularity. So we're waiting for that to get wrapped up, and then we'll uh, move out with a meeting. Uh, hopefully be able to go to draft final proposal on the 15-minute granularity, and then start working with the straw proposal on the flexible ramping product in day ahead. So um, as everyone might recall, at the end of the year, we've been sort of, at the end of last year, we were working through a couple alternatives that we wanted, and we discussed that with everybody in a workshop. Um, as well as at the last MSC meeting. Um, so again, we had the first alternative was to really keep the current day ahead uh, sequence. So we would do market power mitigation and IFM followed by RUC. We would just add the flexible ramping products to the IFM and the RUC would really just be there to get additional unit commitment as it is today. And then the alternative two was to change the sequence where you did RUC first and then did IFM um, and then this allowed you to co-optimize all of the all of the capacity products in RUC and then hold those fixed into IFM. So drum roll, we decided to move forward with alternative one. <laughs> I look at all the surprise faces in the room. <laughs> um, so again, we will co-optimize Energy AS, the flexible ramping product in IFM. Uh, we'll look at doing unit commitment. As, as granular as we possibly can. You clear all your physical virtual supply and load bids uh, in that market. And then look at minimal changes to RUC. Um, we do want to look at additional unit commitment. We may not look at decommitment per se, but we do want to use availability bids um, to where we could actually get upward and downward uh, flexible ramping product basically out of, out of the RUC. Um, and I would note that one of the things that we did look for with it, when we were talking about integrating RUC or doing changes in RUC was really concerns around the need to potentially decommit actual, actually decommit resources. And in talking through with operations, you know, as the 15-minute uh, market and some of the variable energy resource bidding functionality, as that's, as that's matured and more people have taken that on, we're seeing actually sufficient economic bids to curtail from renewables. So the decommitment, while that was a a big concern probably four or five years ago. It's lessened uh, given other design changes that we've introduced. Um, so there wouldn't be any changes to the, the deviation settlements for energy. That was in some of the other, uh, the other proposals. But you would, now that we're introducing a day ahead flexible ramping as well as day ahead uh, corrective capacity, you would, you would settle those deviations just like you do energy today. Carrie. Carrie Brantley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, in our comments on this, and I think at the last MSC meeting, we talked about some other alternatives that you could go with besides your one and two, um, notably um, uh, rock reserve price, for example, or something like, um, I believe it was ISO New York does with a recursive yeah. or reiterative solution. Did you guys look at any other alternatives? Um, I think we, we did look at some other alternatives. Um, and I think when we went through those, we felt that the more conservative approach or the least disruptive approach was simply just to add the flexible ramping product to our, our current process. Um, and again, it really comes around to was that it was decommitment driving the need to integrate RUC or not. And when we determined it wasn't, then we felt that the current sequence and processes that we have, uh, we can simply just add the flexible ramping product to it. So it's a more straightforward um, approach than doing a fundamental redesign. In essence, now we're just adding flexible ramping product to day ahead versus completely redesigning the day ahead market as we initially intended. Uh, I'll take the question on the phone. Okay, we have one question. Caller, go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Uh, hi, Don. It, it's Mark Holman with PowerX. Um, I, I appreciate that you've uh, moved away from Alternative 2, given the concerns that, that many had, including us. Um, but we, we do have some thoughts. I, I think there's a, a couple different areas that I'd like to comment on. First, um, I think Alternative 1 and moving forward with Alternative 1 is going to sustain this out-of-market uh, residual, residual unit commitment side payment approach, and, and a far, far better approach would be to find a solution that co-optimizes energy, unit commitment, flexible ramping up, flexible ramping down, 
um, and, and incorporates better price formation. We have some thoughts and some ideas on that, and we are uh, close to, to having a white paper on that. And so I'd really urge you to consider uh, uh, managing your stakeholder process a little bit differently because you've gone to the MSC, you've thought about it as CAISO staff, and now you're back at the MSC proposing alternative one, and as far as I understand it, there's been no opportunity for stakeholders to provide their thoughts, only CAISO and now the MSC, and so uh, we don't support alternative one. We are concerned about having, perpetuating a residual unit commitment process that provides side payments for capacity that's not in and co-optimized in the energy clearing prices. We have some ideas on how that might be achieved. Um, so that, that's kind of thought one. Thought two is we're concerned about going down alternative one in the context of an EDAM stakeholder process that's mere months away, that to make decisions this large at this juncture without getting broad stakeholder input on what approaches might be workable for other regions um, other than the case, so I, I think is a mistake at this juncture. Um, and then the, uh, I, I, think, I think at the same time, um, it would be interesting to hear broader stakeholders' viewpoints on the importance of price formation and the co-optimization of all of the products you need to maintain reliability relative to potentially competing uh, market enhancements. For example, if your 15-minute granularity is uh, posing a challenge in terms of software processing time that competes with the ability to do a co-optimization, I think that debate needs to occur as well. Um, so I appreciate that you are exploring different alternatives and you've eliminated alternative two, but I really do think it's time to go back to stakeholders, hear stakeholders' thoughts before you come to a recommendation and move further forward. Thanks. So let me address all three of those. Um, first, I would note that the, the, the root of the problem that I, and I, that I think we saw with when we were looking at integrating RUC and IFM, doing RUC first, looking at other potential opportunities to get the ISO's view of the world into the market is really what was causing the problems. And so from a, from a pricing standpoint, um, and so I think that I'm more than happy to and look forward to your white paper, but I think the, the, the concern that we've had and that others have expressed is that it's merely putting the ISO's view of the world into the market that is causing the concerns that they've had with the various alternatives we've looked at uh, uh, in terms of integrating IFM and RUC or changing the order. Um, and I would note that I think if we look at the data that we'll look up here in the, in the future, I think there are interesting discussions we can have around um, uh, how you come up with that flexible ramping requirement. Um, is it, and we, we'll get into that whether it's market uncertainty or uh, is it actually the ISO's view of the world of uncertainty. Um, um, with regards to, to EDAM, um, you know, I think we, uh, you know, we are in the very straw proposal stages of this. Um, and this actually applies to your first comment, to where we are going to be uh, at least putting out a, a discussion in terms of where we think it should go. But again, we'll still continue to look at other uh, opportunity, other design considerations, as well as any enhancements to what we, uh, what we put out. And then lastly, with regards to competing with processing time at the 15-minute market, that's why I made my original comment that we are waiting until we see what we've uh, what the results of our assessment in terms of what we need to do to make sure we can hit the 15-minute scheduling granularity before we come out with a, a next proposal on this because, again, as you pointed out, it, it may limit what you actually could do from an FM, FRP standpoint, but the most extreme being if you actually can't do 15-minute scheduling day ahead, then you can't just use FRP for uncertainty, and that sort of changes the whole thought process around what we're actually trying to get out of this. And I, I guess... Don, I just think to the point, I, I'm not suggesting that in any way virtual bids or energy prices are settling directly against the CAISO's view of the world. We're, we're simply looking for an opportunity to achieve a more efficient dispatch, better price formation practices than what the CAISO has come up with and considered so far. Um, I think that, again, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled or, or I'm finding it challenging that the CAISO is proposing major changes to its IFM based on what it feels is best, 
including 15-minute granularity, FRP versus in the optimization or not, sequential RUC or not, when we're mere months ahead of an EDAM, I think we need to have a stakeholder process to consider all ideas to getting a, a good market design that works for multiple regions. And if we make some pretty big decisions here around 15-minute granularity that may make it impossible to do a co-optimization potentially because of software processing time, or we make a decision around keeping sequential rock, and we find that that has very significant dispatch efficiencies or price formation consequences for other regions, that would be unfortunate to have made decisions right ahead of an EDAM stakeholder process. Well, I, I, would, I would recommend that as we develop this uh, uh, proposal that we should assume that there's going to be an EDAM, and then to the extent that the feasibility assessment says there isn't an EDAM, uh, then we could reassess if we didn't want to move forward with these changes within the ISO. Um, so again, when, I, when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at it as if there is going to be an EDAM, um, and then we are going to have, for instance, a resource efficiency test that may look at the need to have carry a certain amount of flexibility, which is very closely tied to how we, if you look at the real-time resource efficiency, is very closely tied to the flexible ramping product. So I think we should all keep an eye on the in prize on this, which is assuming that the EDAM does move forward because there's a positive feasibility assessment. Thanks, Don. Okay. Is there anybody else on the phone? Carrie. No, there are no Carrie problems. Carrie Bentley of the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, so I appreciated your response to PowerX. I was just wondering, does that mean, was that a no? So y you are not open to other alternatives? I'm always open to alternatives, but again, I think we need to, we need to, I would highly recommend everyone look back at the problems that we were dealing with. I think the, the integrating and trying to get the ISO's view of the world into IFM is what's, what, what we've been stumbling on and, and running into troubles with. But you know, Don, they may not be saying to go back to where you were before, but just, you know, like, you know, like one choice that I think addresses, you know, what Mark was talking about, but I don't, I don't think it's fundamentally changed. Like the assumption under page three, the fixed ancillary service FRU awards from IFM. You know, there might be a way to run a unit commitment step for RUC and then have a final co-optimized dispatch, which achieves some of what Mark was talking about, about integrated pricing, and maybe that's what you had in mind. I'm not sure. But, I mean, that wouldn't be going back to where the ISO was before. It's pretty much following this path. It's just sort of a detail of how you uh, you pull it together. And that might be what, you know, Mark has in mind. So, you yeah, know, there might so be I would concur with that, Scott. To, uh, the, the, the framework you're talking about where you're basically – you know, moving down the path one, but exactly how you implement it and integrate it maybe be something you ought to think about. Yeah, that's fair, Scott. Yeah, Carrie Bentley again with the Western Power Trading Forum. You know, um, we did submit comments on the last one, even though you didn't ask for them, and we spilled a lot of ink on why alternative two wasn't great. Um, but because we spent, spent so much time on that, we didn't really flash out any of our other alternatives, and we'd really love the opportunity to do that before just moving forward. Kind of taking away that comment period um, really hurt us in a way because now you're just moving forward with something else um, without an opportunity for us to really, you know, walk through our proposal. So, as, just to let you know on a little inside baseball, I uh, wanted you guys to all give your comments, but other people wanted to give you a Christmas present. So. <laughs> <laughs> By not it's not a Christmas present if you tell us three days just, before uh, the comment deadline. Right. <laughs> They're already written, man. Um, okay, so moving forward, uh, since I knew there were people that want, know there were people that want to leave at 3.30. Um, so at the last MSC, we talked about data that we would want to gather. Um, and thanks to Abhishek and Guillermo, they were able to pull some data. Uh, and we got it earlier this week where we can try to compare uh, who's more accurate at calling the actual uh, real-time condition? Is it the market or is it the ISO's forecast? So from a day-ahead standpoint, what we want to look at is what is the cleared bid in demand uh, minus the variable energy resources that cleared plus any net virtual demand. So that's trying to get to, you could argue, the dispatchable, virtual, the dispatchable physical supply. 
And then the ISO's version of that would be the net load, our net load forecast, so the ISO's load forecast minus its uh, uh, variable energy resource forecast. And then you would want to compare to the, in the 15 minute market, to what the ISO's version of the net load forecast is. And so whoever's closer from a day ahead to that is uh, more accurate. And the question is, do you look at that on average, on peak days and challenging days? And so what we're gonna share with you is some uh, graphs that we have for the, the first poll of this. Um, so it's pretty hot off the presses, but, and so we're, we're still digging into it, but it does show, show actually, I think some interesting results that would be uh, good to discuss. So um, if we look at the first example here, so, uh, we can see that on the, the green bar, green line is the market and the ISO is the blue line. So you can see, you know, the ISO is a little bit better uh, with the exception of in July and through September where everybody was pretty much the same um, accuracy. And so this is the overall absolute forecast error. Now if we look at the same error uh, with regards to uh, whether they, we were over or under, um, you can see on average, the um, in terms of the market, it was uh, a little higher error in the over, over standpoint than the ISO, and then in the under, uh, you know, part of the time the market was actually better, and then other times the ISO was a little bit better. So we're again we're comparing the day ahead market, day ahead results, to the 15 minute what the ISO is running with in the 15 minute market from a net load standpoint. And so, and, and then both of those are being compared to actual? Not to actual, to what the ISO ran with in the 15 minute market. What, who called the 15, what we, what we ran within the 15 minute market the most accurately? But just can you just go back there. Uh, so what determines whether it's in the, uh, in the top or the bottom? So the top is yeah. whether the, let's see, I, uh, with it's positive, so the top, let me go back, I got a key here. because I So when it's positive, that means the real-time forecast came in higher than the day ahead. So both of them? But I mean, suppose one was yeah. higher and one was lower. That's what I wasn't sure. Are these the same days? I mean. These are the same months comparing the ISO to the market. The yeah. top two lines are when they're, when the real-time market is higher than the day ahead market and who's more accurate in that direction. Okay. The, and then the, the, uh, the bottom one is the other one around where the... Okay, so it, it's when the FMM is higher than the market. Yes. And then you're looking, okay. And then the bottom one is when the FMM is lower. It's, it's when the market, it's relative to the market. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sorry, and the blue line is the ISO's forecast as of day ahead? Correct. Okay. So the, so, that's right. so you have the ISO's net load forecast and then you basically have the markets net forecast as well. Recognizing that virtuals, you know, will yeah. are filling in where there, where there are errors in what was scheduled. So that is what the RUC would have been based on, basically. RUC would have been not based on, it would assume there was no, we don't assume there's any virtuals when we come up with our net load forecast. Right, but that, yeah. that's the blue line. Right. So, yeah. so this is an interesting one where we see uh, uh, over the hour. So you can see actually in the middle part of the day, or, you know, they're relatively the same error. Uh, between the market as well as the ISO, but in the there's greater error in the middle of the night, and there's another chart that will come up uh, soon that actually is even more interesting on that because this so is sort of on absolute average. error. That is the absolute error. So now this is the more interesting chart where we actually show the hourly distributions um, for. Uh, uh, both of them. So on the left side, we have the ISO's accuracy, and on the right side, we have the market's accuracy. Um, and I, when I first got these slides from uh, Abhishek, I used the high-tech tool of a ruler at my desk to put the black line in. So, but for the pre presentation, I figured I'd add one. And so you can see on the left chart, which is the ISO, that we are on average actually over-forecasting pretty much every hour in the day. And if you look on the right side with regards to the market, they're actually under forecasting day ahead at the night and are pretty much okay or you know sometimes above, sometimes below in the middle of the day. Um, and the other takeaway I took from this is if you look at the actual 
distribution or spread between the two, they're relatively the same. And so I think that opens up some questions in terms of or opportunities to where, well, you could maybe you could clear, determine your flexible ramping up product based upon the uncertainty associated with the market, and then you're actually capturing both what you need from a, a RUC standpoint as, and uh, uh, because in essence, if you cover the full market uncertainty, then there's sufficient up and down capability just within the market. So any comments or questions on this one? Yeah, Roger. Uh, Roger from DMM. I said, no, it was a very interesting data you're showing. I just wonder how it would change if you did net virtuals, not just virtual demand. Oh, we did do net virtuals. So it's just net. Yep. Who it said, it said virtual demand on the chart. Oh, I did. I think it said net virtual demand on it. Okay. And I also think it'd be interesting to see like similar charts compared to like you know, the actual load versus the, the FMM too. It might be interesting to see how these charts would change. Okay. Um, I have to change it all, you know. No, and I, again, the way I sort of looked at this is if you were trying to, remember, you think about the flexible ramping product, it's ensuring that you have sufficient ramp capability by having economic bids submitted into the real-time market. The first market you need to solve is the FMM, and so this is the uncertainty between that and FMM. And then you've still got additional uncertainty between FMM and RTD, which is the the, the, the real-time flexible ramping up requirement. But I agree we could look at those because I think that might, if you look at the actual, that might uh, make you ask how much of, how much of the uh, real-time FRP requirement do you want to try to cover in the day-ahead time frame too. Carrie. Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. So I'm sorry to be slow. It's Friday afternoon. So this is all just Day ahead compared to FMM. Um, why I why would you not set up the day ahead flexible ramping product to account for your flexibility needs in real time? Uh, Essentially, you're trying to set up your resources the best you can, right? You you would, but again, I, I, what I, we were trying to answer is, is who's calling it more accurately. And so, uh, if we get to a subsequent slide, you'll highlight that I think what you would have for a day ahead requirement is you would need to cover your uncertainty that materializes between day ahead and the 15 minute market, plus you need to cover your FMM FRP requirement. That's, but I think that's what Roger's getting, and that's why I said there's, that whether you have to cover 100% of your FMM FRP requirement, maybe there's something you could, you could tease out if you looked at the actual data that you made not for some reason. But again, we're really, the key here was trying to answer who, who, who was actually calling it better. Or, and I think even a, a different question, it's less about whether or not they're calling it better, it's whether or not it's materially different. Because I think one of the things that we had thought when we were looking at integrating these and doing the more uh, uh, revolutionary changes to the day ahead market was the assumption that the ISO is materially better. So if the ISO is materially better, you would absolutely want to try to use the IS, get your, the ISO's information into there. But these charts, you know, sort of question whether you'd actually need to do that. Lindsay. Lindsay Schlockoy with MV Energy. Um, I'd also like, I, I, I'm also interested in the FMM to real time because I'd like to see if the KISO forecast is also over forecasting in the FMM as well. Sure, yeah. Okay, let's go to the phone. We have one question over the phone line. Caller, go ahead, your line is unmuted. Uh, hi, John. It's Mark Coleman. Uh, thanks for this data. This is a great data to take a look at. I just had a, a couple thoughts. One is that um, this is looking at, as I understand it, which is more accurate from a net load forecasting perspective, which I think is a, a good perspective to look at. But I, I think there's another perspective that we should also recognize, which is virtuals are motivated by price, not by net load. And so it would be interesting to see, and I don't know if it's possible to do, which was more accurate from a price perspective. Because if there's distortions, for example, in the FMM price, whether that's load biasing or exceptional dispatch or other things, and virtuals are correctly calling that, they may be off on net load, but it's a profitable activity for them to be off on net load. So I think that um, we need to recognize that virtuals are following price and they will converge net load to the extent we don't have distortions 
where price isn't accurately connected or efficiently connected to net load. Um, so, so that's one piece just to consider because obviously there's some pretty powerful incentives um, for virtuals to try to get price right as opposed to net load right. Uh, the second comment I wanted to make is just, um, just to clarify on the earlier point, we fully agree um, that the energy market solution needs to clear against bid-in demand, including net virtual demand, and that it should not be clearing against the CAISO's forecast. However, spinning reserve, non-spinning reserve are not market quantities that are determined, but they're determined by standards. Regulating reserve are effectively balancing reserves where the CAISO decides how much regulating reserve it needs to carry, and it includes the procurement of that product and the co-optimization of that product in both the dispatch and pricing. And that was really what we're getting at is that we, we feel that it's important that if the CAISO is buying an additional quasi-reserve product in flexible ramping up and flexible ramping down and or even unit commitment for capacity more generally and needing to do that to protect against uncertainty in net load, that that quantity um, needs to go into the co-optimization. We are not supporting the past proposals of energy, energy being dispatched against the CAISO forecast of load, rather that uh, capacity products that the CAISO needs to procure, whether it's for a reliability standard, whether it's regulating reserve that may be subjective or on some objective methodology, or it's flexible ramping up, flexible ramping down, residual unit commitment subjectively or based on some objective methodology, the co-optimization of that in both the dispatch, pricing, and settlement is essential to good price formation. Thanks. Okay, so so okay, so that's we, we were going to co-optimize FRP and everything in IFM. I think the question is, is it was is, was there some residual amount that you would do through RUC? Um, but the whole intent is that you would put the bulk the the, the the requirement and just like ancillary services into the IFM. And we think we have some ideas on how you could eliminate ROC and get to a good dispatch solution with good price formation, while having virtuals actually even be more effective and more pure at settling against uh, energy and energy prices than they are today. So hopefully you'll have an opportunity to submit written comments on that. And I think, and I think, Mark, if you, I think, Mark, if you look at this data, if you actually, we all became comfortable that the uncertainty that we needed to cover was the uncertainty that the market called wrong, then what do you need the ruck portion when the market called it wrong except for, you know, in extreme cases where something went really haywire? So, I mean, I think we're going down the path that you're suggesting. So the next on slide nine, we wanted to, to as we said, you know, we sort of looked at on average uh, data here, and these are uh, what we consider a, a challenging solar day. Um, and what's interesting is uh, if you look in the middle of the day, you can see a pretty good size solar reduction or increase in output. Um, and actually, the market and the ISO were both equally off. And you can see the same pattern where the the uh, uh, the the um, market is under scheduling on those middle of the night hours, which I think gets to Scott some of the things that you've pointed out is who's actually backfilling that in when it's needed or who's actually curtailing off when that's not, uh, not or if, when it's actually not needed. So, but again, what's interesting to me is in the middle of the day, even on the severe day, they, we basically both called it the same. Um, and then on a wind day, uh, a little different pattern, but uh, um, again, you can see there's actually uh, some instances in this one example here where the where the market actually called it a little bit better uh, on a challenging load day than the market than the ISO did, uh, and these these load these load issues is really when do you call the peak? You know, usually it looks like everyone got the peak pretty close, but they called it off by an hour or two, and whoever got it the right had the the more accurate forecast. So again, that's the first pass. Where again we're trying to see the the comparison between the Who's, who's more accurate? And again, it's materially more accurate because I think that's the real question that we need to answer because if it's not materially better, I think it opens up a lot of opportunity for us to, or ch ways to think differently about how the flexible ramping product can work in the day ahead time frame. 
Um, and so I'm on slide 11. So we've already sort of teed this out a little bit. Two, you know, there's a couple approaches you could do this. What if you put the FRP requirement in the day ahead market is really that market uncertainty that we observe? Um, and then in essence, the FRP is covering the, the uncertainty that the market has between the uh, day ahead and the 15 minute market. Um, and then if you uh, looked at the ISO and tried to think sort of the, the, the traditional way we think today, you know, we would uh, uh, do, we, would we need to, to cover, you know, additional shortages in, in the IFM uh, to net load, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the RUC process. Um, and then as I pointed out before, we're not just trying to solve uncertainty between the ahead and FM, and you also need to add the, the FRP requirement in. Um, and then as I said as well, so depending on how you actually implement the FRP, does the role of RUC actually change? Um, and one thing, I think there's a couple of interesting questions. Uh, you know, is there really a difference between a, a RUC availability bid and a flexible ramping up a bid? I mean, if you think about both of them, they have to be able to come in and provide upward dispatch capability. So they sound a lot alike to me. Um, and this then, so again, uh, and the same thing would go on a down standpoint. If you wanted to introduce sort of a downward ruck availability bid, isn't that really very similar to a, a flexible ramping down bid? And then if you start thinking about, well, you know, I've got basically enough FRP set up in the, based on the market requirements, is this something where I could do RUC later or where I'm really trying to either backfill a, uh, a significant outage or something else triggers me to then go say I need to get additional real-time dispatch capability. Um, again, I think we're, we're trying to minimize the amount of, of, of RUC changes here, but I think depending on how the how we decide to come up with the requirement based on the data that I previously showed you, I think it, that does provide some additional opportunities to uh, rethink the RUC. Um, next is on slide 13 with regards to bidding. So we are proposing to allow bidding on um, all of the day ahead products now. Uh, so we would uh, uh, have a flexible ramping up product, a RUC availability up product, uh, corrective capacity or CME up, um, and then the subsequent down products of those, and those all could be um, economically bid. Um, and so I think there's some discussion around that that I wanted to have. Um, the key is those, these, what, I, what I'm calling dispatch products, which I'm trying to differentiate between the ancillary services, is really these dispatch products, the flexible ramping up, ruck availability up, corrective capacity up. I sort of bundled those all together because really they're the ability to re-dispatch into real time in the upward direction, and then likewise you've got downward dispatch products. And the questions I have around this is, uh, do you need different bid prices for each one of these capacities? And do you need different bid prices for uh, each of the upward products and then different ones for each of the downward products? Or is up and down really the same cost as well? Um, and then it also leads to on, two, on the contingency reserves, you know, spinning reserves, you basically have to have the ability to be dispatched up, just not through the market, through a real-time contingency dispatch, and likewise, non-spinning reserves. So are there really material costs um, between these resources? Would you like some discussion now? Sure. Let me, okay. uh, let me go two more slides. Um, and so the question is, um, we are going to also re-optimize re all of these products into real time. Um, and so we would not expect to have bids submitted for dispatch products in the real-time market because once you've actually made yourself available, even if you don't have a day ahead uh, award on these, you have basically said, I've procured the capability, so it's a sunk cost to you. Um, we've also, we currently allow uh, real-time bids for spinning reserves and non-spinning reserves. You know, are, do we really need to continue to have bids for those? I would sort of argue no, because really, again, the same thing, you've made yourself available, whether you're held for an ancillary service or uh, energy, the energy opportunity cost is truly the cost of you providing that service. And then lastly, with regards to regulation, regulation up and, excuse me, regulation up and regulation down, I think these are actually a little different, and that's really because we actually settled the regulation energy. So to the extent that someone's worried that they're going to be regged down when the price is $1,000, they can reflect those sort of 
certainty within their regulation bids. Um, and so then, lastly, I think when that, so then, then I think we should open up for discussion. Then is really on the if we do allow this day ahead bidding for the dispatch products, do we need to actually come up with some market power mitigation rules? And here I went through sort of the various uh, granularity that we'd be procuring these. So if you look at corrective capacity, that's going to be procured nodal. So obviously you need to have uh, uh, some sort of mitigation approach. Uh, with regards to ruck availability, um, that's also ensures, you know, we ensure that that's transmission feasible, so that also could do, uh, need it. Um, if you look at sort of the initial thoughts of implementing the flexible ramping product, you know, we want to procure it sub-regionally like we do with ancillary services today. So as long as you have a sub-region that's competitive, then you probably don't. But as we've seen with some of the deliverability stuff that we've looked with regards to the flexible ramping product, you know, we do see the need to go more and more granular uh, in the future. Um, and I think the ancillary services are very similar to the FR. So with that, Ben, so, so I think so it's discussions on whether the bid costs are different and whether you need mitigation, and then we can get to the next slide is where we can talk about how would you think about even doing it, mitigation, that is. Um, yeah, so uh, if you could go up the slide, uh, I think the, um, yeah, that's good. So um, we'll see whether any of my colleagues have any comments on this. Um, and, um, I, I can channel Scott. I know Scott, but in, in discussions you've asked whether um, the responsiveness, the response times needed for FRU might be different for ROC and different for corrective capacity, or no, oh, yes or no. Um, and, and maybe that's not quite clear. We, we've talked in previous MSC meetings about um, the FRU acquired day ahead, some of that is for forecast error that you can see coming a long ways off, so you don't need 10-minute um, response for all of it. But you need 10-minute response for some of it, certainly the, the FRU that's there in real time. Um, so that might be example. I'm wondering if there are other attributes that might differ between. But I think we have talked about that you could have, uh, especially in the day ahead time frame, uh, you know, we would let interties be able to provide, uh, meet the FMM uncertainty. So some of the stuff that's only dispatchable in 15 minute blocks, uh, you know, we can get some of that day ahead. And we, and we would do that by the sub regional procurement where we would have a system level requirement where the interties could count, but in some of the sub regions only internal generation could count. And that way we could then separate the five minute dispatchable from the, the 15 minute dispatchable. Um, but I do also see your, your comment in terms of, you know, if you look at some of this uncertainty, if it's some, a, a big change, it's reflected in all of the, like, you know, like let's say it's a big wind event, it's going to be reflected for probably four or five hours potentially of the uncertainty that we saw there to where you would really only need to address it once um, and you could address it. You know, and that's where I think rethinking the, the ruck portion of it is, is that something where you actually, you see the outage and then you go, do some ruck process where you now come in and say, okay, now I need to get the real-time dispatch capability to come in and, and, and offset this one, yeah. one issue. So uh, if you need different attributes, then if there might be price separation and if the um, uh, resources can provide those different attributes, uh, different levels of that attribute to have different costs, I'm not sure what those costs would be. Um, uh, I mean, basically we're talking about the cost of reserving gas and the risk of having to dump the gas back in if you don't use it. Um, we'd, have to, we'd have to pick at that a little bit to understand the, the components of these costs. Um, and of course, you could say that, uh, well, you could, the market will just reveal it, but then if we have to do market power mitigation, then we, we do have to understand it. So I, I do think you'll see different prices again for 15 minute and five minute because of the different system versus sub-region requirements. So you'll, you'll see that if it makes itself available. But I think the real question is, is do it, I mean, I'd be interested in market participants on this as well is, you know, do you, would you really, do you really see yourself having to have separate bids for, you know, all of these various products, even though they look pretty close to the same, especially if you look at like a, a flexible, a five minute flexible ramping up and corrective capacity. I mean, those look, yeah. Very, very similar. They wouldn't need to know what they're being used for, right? Yeah. 
Or why would they have a preference for which one they would want to be used for? Roger. Sorry, uh, Roger on the scheme, man. Um, if I'm given a day ahead flex ramp up award, of say like 100 megawatts, that means in real time I can't sell that 100 megawatts for flex ramp up again. But if I'm given a rough award for the 100 megawatts, I can. So it seems like whether I'm awarded FRU or RUC matters if I think there's going to be potentially positive prices or higher prices for FRU in real time. Yeah, and I, I think you're making an assumption there that if you if you that that the the RUC product wouldn't, for instance, maybe you'd have the, you'd have the same rule as the FRU that the RUC availability. That settles against your real-time FRU. Or, or, or say corrective, whether I correct the capacity or not. If I correct the capacity, it means I can't sell correct the capacity in real time, but I, I can sell flex ramp up in real time. Well, I think I think on the corrective capacity, I think, give, remember, on an earlier slide, we talked about that we would re-optimize all of the products without, and with no bid costs in there. So I think there it would just make the economic trade-off in real time, was it better for you to maintain your corrective capacity award or to provide FRP? Right, but what I'm saying is that it will matter to me when I come to real time which award I already had. Not if it's optimized in real time, because it will always be re-optimizing based on your costs, and you'll be put into the highest value usage based on your bids. No, they just so what is, you're going to have to buy back the old position and, and then get paid for the new position. So if they have the same shadow price, you net nothing. But if you get used in a way that's got a higher shadow price, then you'll make money. We're not going to let you buy, you know, we're not going to pay you for a new position and let you out of the old position for nothing. If you do that, then obviously you want to churn. But right. that's not, the, that, Don's saying we're not going to do that. All right. Would the exception be RUC, though? Well, you would say RUC is like a reserve. Do you want to have that's that's capacity you're holding back for things that happen? So you wouldn't let it go and be sold to the Pacific Northwest in real time because you set its shadow price to zero. You'd want to continue to hold it, right? Yeah. There'd be RUC day ahead. There'd be RUC, a RUC sort of product and. No time to, and if you were chosen you know, for rock day yeah, ahead, a 30 minute reserve product or a 15 minute reserve product or something. Uh, the, uh, the rock capacity that you procure in rock will be available either for energy or for procuring capacity again in real time. So there's no rock product in real time, but there are other products that this rock uh, capacity could be used for. So it will be reprocured as another type of commodity. So uh, this is the issue that Don raised then. You might be paid something for rock day ahead, and then then you can sell that same megawatt for something else. Um, yes, you get it's paid. Not. So that as a result, you're ret um, you'll, you might make more money being chosen for rock than being chosen for FRU or something else. Yeah. So it's no different than today, uh, Ben, when you have the rack availability payment in exchange for your must offer obligation to participate in real time for it, and then when you participate in real time, you can get an energy dispatch out of it that's new money. So that's not different. So basically the rack uh, capacity is really an availability that you get to keep once you become available. And then from it, you can have more products out of it in real time. Uh, so John, correct me if I misunderstand. It's the issue is then if we now bid, you bid for ROC and you bid for FRU and other things, should we allow folks to be bid differently for ROC and, and then for FRU because? Or, or do we need to have settlement mechanisms to where if you actually got awarded for ROC and then were converted to like flexible ramping up, that there actually isn't an imbalance settlement that you would do there? I, I mean, I think that's open for discussion through the stakeholder process in terms of how you would want to do that. And a lot of it comes down to is, what does that what does that ruck product actually become because you know if we look at this and we bought the uncertainty around the the market then the fact that the market cleared different than we did thought it should have but there's sufficient bids to cover what we thought was good, that we're okay with too then you wouldn't do anything and then ruck maybe is something where it's uh you know you you run it at 10 o'clock at night because you actually saw that things actually changed and you want to make sure that you've got some uh, medium start stuff ready to go because some some system condition changed from what the market was aware of. 
Carrie. Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Are you going to demand curve the FRP? That's correct. That's the plan. Yeah, I think if you use a demand curve for the FRP, then you have to keep Brock as a separate mechanism, and then I think it makes sense to have separate prices as well. Um, and also just, uh, this is a kind of nitpicky point, but um, contractually, when you sell RA, Rock is treated very different, and that always goes to essentially the buyer and ancillary services and things like flexibility products are already in RA contracts, and, you know, the person who gets to keep energy revenues gets to keep those. So it seems like it would be easier. I mean, if you want to maybe simplify this and actually simplify it, you could kick out corrective capacity. I don't know why you need a separate bid for that. You right. could combine that with FRP and then keep rock as it is. No, and I think uh, I think we, we do think it's important that, especially when you move to an EDAM framework, that rock availability bids, even if it served the same rock purpose, that you would want that to be actually bid without everybody putting in, for instance, RA resources with a must offer obligation of zero because they could potentially meet the RUC requirement of another balancing authority area. So you'd want everyone to reflect how much they're willing to set capacity aside to meet somebody else's need. Um, and so early on we talked about how we would want to transition this, uh, which is another reason why it's nice that we're planning from an implementation to stagger these uh, where you could actually and, and give a long lead time so that those RA contracts can reflect that we're moving to a, a world where there's not going to be a zero RA bid for RUC. You wouldn't need to do anything for RA contracts, even if any revenues from RUC go to the LSC, okay. so that's easy enough. I, I just don't understand why you would need an up and a down. I think simplifying this as much as possible um, would be helpful. No, okay. no, I completely agree. So, so I think you're, you're, so you, you're actually saying you don't even need a difference between flexible ramping up and flexible ramping down? Yeah, I, I well, I agree with PowerX. I think we should look at lots of alternatives, but I think one of the alternatives should be a simple version of what you're presenting here for sure. Oh, can you, since I have the mic, can you clarify um, your second bullet here? So today you could have real-time bids for spin and non-spin. Are you proposing to take that away? And are you proposing to re-optimize AS in real-time? Correct. Yes to both. But again, that's sort of our, again, that's our initial thinking. And that's very similar to what we said when we talked about this early on, regardless of how we structured the day ahead market, that we did want to re-optimize everything coming into real time. Uh, you know, aside from the economic uh, case for or against bidding in real time, does FERC have a requirement that we have to allow bidding not that I'm aware of. For ancillary services? No. Both New York and I as New England have eliminated real-time bids for ancillary services a decade ago. More than a decade. Okay, so uh, the next point is, you know, we currently sort of have mitigation based upon where the various caps are set. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but this is sort of our only real approach. Um, and then the question is, as we move to having bidding for these sort of capacity products, um, what sort of approaches do we need to take to, to the extent that we do need mitigation? I think the first is, is how would you calculate a, what I'm calling a default capacity bid? Um, and, you know, you can think of it that it probably does differ by fuel type. So if you think of a gas resource, it's the cost of the ability to either procure or dispose of gas in real time relative to what they thought they were going to be doing day ahead. Uh, for a hydro system, you know, we've heard that lots of them, they, you know, they, they have lots of flexibility to set it up, things up day ahead, but then there's costs associated with changing off of that in real time. You know, that's a cost that may not, may need to be reflected. And then next, with regards to demand response, you know, you need to have people that need to have it ready to respond. And so is there an actual cost associated with that that you would want to reflect uh, that to the extent that uh, DR was uh, awarded flexible ramping in the day ahead time frame? Flexible ramping. I mean, that's where demand response might be able to provide a good way to, to deal with the luck uncertainty. If you've got load forecast uncertainty and they can't be dispatched in five minutes, but they can respond in half an hour and you can see trouble coming a half hour away. So actually, that's good, that's, you know, because we are. That's a good thing about demand response is it doesn't soak up minimum load. You don't have to back down wind or have it online. No. And you've got the ability to deal with. Uh, no, and as you recall, in Ezra 3, you know, we basically 
put in place the what we're calling like the slow DR, where we're basically using the intertie functionality where we can treat them like an hourly block, which gives them a 52 and a half minute lead time. We can give them as a 15 minute block and use them as 22 and a half minute lead times. And I, I agree, I think that that's rethinking what Ruck's actually trying to get you to, to solve. It's not the, the five minute or 15 minute uncertainty, it's those big changes that you see coming and respond once and you've resolved it. Yeah, so be reposturing the system after you have a contingency, you've used up your contingency reserves and now you've got to re recreate them, but you've got, you don't have to do that in five minutes. Uh, let's go to the phone. Okay, I have one question over the phone. Caller, go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Uh, hi, guys. Mark Coleman. I'm just, you may have answered part of it, but I'm just trying to understand better what you're covering with flexible ramping up versus rock. Um, we, you know, we obviously have error in net load forecast, there's um, there's obviously a difference if you have a virtual supply, if you have uh, inner tie uh, deviations or potentials for failures, there's quite a few components that could cause you to need more or less capacity and flexible capacity. And it's not clear from what I've seen you, you put out so far uh, what you're trying to cover with rock that you can't cover with flexible ramping up or that's more efficient to cover with rock outside the market process? Well, or I think, I think you're, you're, you, you've actually got the main point of the presentation, <laughs> which is uh, with the introduction of FRP, what, what do you really need rock for? And it, a lot of it depends upon where, what you set the requirement off. Because if you set the requirement off of the market, then the market should be covering some, the, the FRP should be covering some of the differences in the views of the world that the ISO saw day ahead and the market. Because as long as we meet the, as long as the market uncertainty is covered, then we know that the, any difference that the ISO had relative to the market clearing would be covered as well. Now, I think there are issues around the fact that you're going to use a demand curve. So what if it determines that it's so expensive you don't want to cover any of your uncertainty? Would you then want to have some ruck process where you come in and commit additional resources or, or in essence, go try to get FRP or, or RUC availability. Um, I think that's sort of open. I think if you use the ISO, go ahead. Sorry, Don, I just, I'm just looking at and saying, okay, you have, a, you have a, an energy market run where let's say that you've got uh, whatever it is. Let's say you've got 36,000 megawatts of firm physical supply that's awarded and your, your P95 or whatever you end up using for net load is 40,000, it seems like you need 4,000 megawatts of upward capacity to cover that uncertainty. What, what I'm struggling with is what the benefit of RUC is relative to flexible ramping up to cover that difference. I understand the comment that if it's too expensive, but I, I'm concerned that too expensive means it's cheaper to buy it out of the market than to buy it in the market. And it's always going to be cheaper to buy something out of the market through side payments. And so I'm just struggling with this idea that, well, we're only going to use flexible ramping up to cover some of the needs. And then if there's other bigger needs and we don't like the price it costs, we'll buy that anyways, but we'll do it outside the market solution. And I'm just, it's not clear to me why you can't buy all of your upward needs. You buy regulation up, why you can't buy all of your upward needs between the cleared physical supply and whatever objective measure you have for your upward load risk tolerance level through a product that is in the market. And that's not talking about clearing the energy market against your forecast. It's talking about covering your uncertainty, whether that uncertainty is on the supply side, on the demand side, or it's because you have virtual supply instead of physical supply it's still not clear to me why you need to have something bought out of market. So, so, Mark, I agree, and that's the point that I was trying to show on slide eight, which we can go back to. It, I mean, if you look at the distribution of errors and where they are on an, you know, an actual amount, these two slot, the two graphs look very much the same. And so to the extent that you covered the forecast or the, the, the market Air, I'm pretty comfortable that you could co cover the ISO's version of what their forecast error was. So if you are procuring FRP uh, to cover the uncertainty shown on the right chart, 
I don't know what else you, if you have, really do have that upward and downward dispatch capability from the IFM schedules, I don't know why you would necessarily need to go ruck something more. I think you're, you're, making, you're, you're, all, you're making an argument that, well, maybe you shouldn't demand curve day ahead. You should try to buy the P95 or, you know, you, you, you don't do as, as, you know, if you think about the demand curve in, in real time, it's really trying to make sure you don't use it now because you might need it later. Or no, it makes sure that if you really need it now, just use it because, you know, why let it, why, why wait because you know there's a problem right now where this is more pre-staging the whole system. I'm just saying if there's something that's going to cause you to rock, whatever that is, why can't that be in the flexible ramping up demand curve? If, you're, if there's anything left that you might have to ruck for, why can't that get incorporated into the quantity of flexible ramping up you need to buy and be part of the market solution? Mark, you know, the idea was never that ruck should ever be buying anything. The idea is it's just supposed to be an insurance policy so that if someone screws up, the lights don't go out. And the, the ideal ruck is a process that's run and never clears anything, but it's there to make sure nothing bad happens. And a real live story that one night, in the middle of the night, a, the employee of a, of a large company went in and zeroed out all of that company's bids for the next day. And the lights didn't go out because ruck kicked in. It was extremely expensive for that company to not have anything cleared in the day ahead market, but the lights didn't go out. And they had better controls on who had access to their bids from then on. But the, the idea was we don't want to have a situation where what one market participant does, you know, it's one grid. And we can't have the lights go out because somebody does, you know, something bad. And, but it's not supposed to be putting more, I agree with you, it shouldn't be putting more capacity online every, time, every day. And the other thing that's complicated about it is because it's intended, it's dispatched to make sure we can actually meet the forecast load. And that makes it tricky because you've, you, how do you determine that you've got the stuff in the right place? Remember, we've got very simplified rules for flexi ramp procurement that don't really make sure it's in the right place. And the I, what makes RUC complicated is the way it's set up to do this hypothetical dispatch to meet the forecast load. You know, I was involved in the process of coming up with that, and it's because the vendors couldn't figure out any other way to do it. And they said, well, it's just reserved, and they thought, oh, no, that doesn't work. That will put the lights out because we won't have them where we need them. So we got this clunky process, but it ensures that, you, that, that you've got the ability to, uh, to meet the load if that, if that forecast you're using materializes. And it actually can be you know, a restraining influence if the operators feel they're comfortable that this test is being done. The worst thing is when they, the operators are going in and putting stuff in ad hoc because they're, not, they're worried about whether they've got the ability to, to meet load, and that really crushes things in real-time prices. So, I agree. It shouldn't. It, when we have people, when we have rocky being committed all the time, that's a that's a concern. And uh, and to put it in and have reserves to pay for it at least. But the ideal rock is something that is hardly ever used, and the capacity is indistinguishable really from everything else. I think, and that's what I'm trying to show on the slide eight. I think if you did get flexible ramping up products that covered 95% of the forecast uncertainty we see that the market's delivering, you're not going to rock very often. And so I can I understand what you said, yeah, Dr. Perfect. Hardy. I think if, if the market's limited geographically and you have to do rare exceptional dispatches to cover a limitation of the market model, such as a geographic location, that makes sense to me. What concerns me is what we see today between exceptional dispatch, rock, and load biasing is ongoing systemic out-of-market actions that suppress prices, and we're trying to get to a design that that really makes that out of market should be very rare where the market model has, has failed to be able to accomplish something, not something that becomes an ongoing tool of out of market procurement. John's talking about it, putting the, the FRM in the day ahead market will help, uh, help do that. George. Yes, um, so I'm going to give an example here to illustrate why I believe rack capacity and flexible ramp product are different or should be treated differently. Um, so let's say, for example, um, the IFM clears with the uh, 
clears load, let's say we don't have virtual demand, and load clears uh, 10,000 megawatt, which happens to be exactly the ISO demand forecast. All right? And we also procured uh, 500 megawatts of flexible ramp up capacity to handle uncertainty that may materialize on top of the demand forecast. And let's say that also we had uh, 2,000 megawatts of virtual supply that cleared. Um, the rack capacity is what you need to replace the 2,000 megawatt of virtual supply and has nothing to do with the 500 megawatt of capacity that you need to set aside to handle uncertainties. You could potentially say, well, why don't I have a capacity product for 2,500 megawatts? which will address the both, and I think maybe Mark alluded to that, but the fact that the flexible RAM product in real time does not have this uh, feature of covering for any capacity gap between demand forecasts for the load and for the ISO demand forecast will eventually alter what the flexible RAM product is in day ahead versus real time, and since we reprocure uh, or we intend to reprocure the flex brand product through the markets and settle it consistently, it is better to consider the rack capacity as a separate product at its own marginal price, which if we have the rack separate, it will come from rack. With the previous discussions on whether we could combine rack with IFM, we could have everything co-optimized, but we're not going that route not only because it's right or wrong. There are actually practical considerations that we, we tried. We considered having uh, 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 formulations that could bring uh, FM and RAC together, but uh, practically we're not at the position to achieve the performance that is required to solve this larger problem. So we'll have to settle with what we can do with the tools that we have available. I, I think, George, you touched on exactly our concern. Which is, which is a, a virtual supply is a good example, and we're concerned that the pursuit of 15 minute granularity may be eating up software time that, that may be competing with a co optimization of procuring capacity uh, to offset things such as virtual supply. Because if you're replacing virtual supply with a RUC process, then RUC is not this rare process to protect reliability when things go really wrong. It's an out-of-market process to replace virtual supply with, with physical capacity, and I think that, that is part of our concern. Yeah, but why a completely out-of-market process? If we intend to do it with a rack uh, process based on bids and um, an optimal outcome, you can say that it's a different market, but it's not really out-of-market. You're still finding an efficient solution using bids. I think the difference between you goes back to that thing on page three about whether the awards, in, uh, the AS awards and FRU and FRD are fixed from the IFM when you roll in the RUC or if you recalculate prices. And I think Mark's concerns are addressed if you do a separate commitment and dispatch, but you calculate price, your final prices are calculated in a step which has got the, the RUC commitments and the RUC demand in there and so that all the, the, the all the capacity needs are reflected in the clearing price, I think that would address Mark's concern. And I think that's one of the things, you know, that's getting down to the details. I think there's some things like that we need to talk about. And it's, and it's not simple uh, because there's locational elements to RUC that aren't in, uh, in FRU. But conceptually, I don't think Don, what's Don's outline, Mark, uh, forecloses the kind of uh, Pricing, I think you have in mind, but there's some some choices and implementation issues. Right, Scott. Regarding I that, um, co-optimizing the capacity with the energy in the IFM, you have the um, the advantage that you have um, a solution that the co-optimization of capacity versus energy shows the true prices and the opportunity cost between energy and capacity. Uh, taking these capacity products and essentially re-optimizing them in RAC, even if we introduce a, a supplement for deviations there, uh, I don't think that's a problem, but what happens is that in RAC we abandon the use of the energy bid, so we want to have RAC just using capacity bids because we want to have a capacity product using energy 
bids in Iraq was problematic, actually, from what we saw from comments from the participants, and we realized that. So if we are going to redo this procurement of capacity in Iraq without the energy bids, now we're going to lose the link between the uh, opportunity cost of energy and capacity. So it is problematic in its... Uh, but, in you, know, you can do the kind of approach that New York does, where you have a bid load unit commitment, then you have a ruck commitment, and then you do a final dispatch with everything in. But New York doesn't put, actually put in reserve bids for the ruck. We, we, that's the thing that you could do, is do a final step where you, you hold the unit commitment fixed, you dispatch for energy, and you, and you schedule you know, flexible capacity or whatever reserves to, to meet these other requirements. So I think that's you know, feasible, but I think where it gets really complicated is the the geographic element of RUC, where there there could be a congestion component to RUC, where their F where our FRU is is regional, so that's where I think there's there's some real complications that aren't so easy to figure you know to sit sit here and in five minutes sketch out how to do it, but conceptually that's what you'd like to do, but it may be you know that there's just really hard conceptual problems that have to be addressed in getting there, but I think that would do what you want and address what Mark's, you know, want, but we have to figure out how that how that works out, what the consequences would be. My uh, my final sort of point on, you know, so once you've sort of come up with some default capacity bid, um, you know, how do you actually, or the next one is do you, do you do sort of a soft bid cap and then similar to what they did with four quarter 831 because we know we can't get a precise estimate of this default capacity bids and so you have a $10 cap let's say but then if someone showed you that they actually had higher costs that you could then update that um, and then I'm interested in any other approaches that, that uh, anyone could come up with on this. Dan. Hey Don, Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions, so it's not a new approach, but just a request as we're moving towards working on the straw proposals, and that's just given the long lead time between now and the implementation on this, it would be, I think, really helpful for stakeholders to see what the ISO is assuming the market landscape will be at the time of implementation, so charting out across things like what we discussed yesterday with the RA enhancements of there being a real-time must-offer obligation for import RA putting some of those things down in place and saying this is what the market's going to look like in 2021 when we implement this so that we have all those things kind of in mind of what your solution's fitting within, I think would be helpful for folks to clear out, you know, all the changes that are going to happen that are implementing fall of 2019 and fall of 2020 or expected in 2021 that this lives um, alongside. It's kind of a, you can intone it by reading the release user group slides, but it would just be helpful to have that. And then part of that being that that then also helps folks go, well, if any one of those things changes, does that then mean that you have to change this proposal as well? Um, so just a, a thought there. And then the other one was um, just kind of a reaction of uh, some surprise or some request to tie some of uh, this proposal and the Dame 1 proposal coming out back to the MSC opinion paper um, you know, from the discussion last week on, was it earlier this week, just on price formation in general and some of those concerns. And I'm just I'm surprised that we've only really touched on those tangentially today through Mark's comments and, and some of Dr. Harvey's comments. Um, but it would be nice to just kind of see how these proposals and the ISO's view are impacting some of those concerns that were raised um, on price formation that uh, MSC opinion brought up. So the I, the, the price formation issue is an, is really a, a HASP issue um, because we don't settle the HASP anymore. Uh, then there was a whole real, bunch of reasons why that was a bad idea, um, and so the fact that we have the and, and so so you see the issue with the with with, with the HASP. Um, and so again, to the extent that there's uh, biasing and uh, other changes to the input data that end up being wrong, then there are issues with the bad input data resulting in uh, inconsistencies between what you thought one time you ran the market and the next time you ran the market. So 
Yes, I mean, I do, we, we are, we do consider these things. We do, you know, look at the other initiatives, knowing where every, where it's going. I think we can help paint the picture for people. Um, so that's all I'm asking is making it explicit, helping paint the picture for folks so it's a little easier to uh, see what's, you know, in your assumptions that are driving some of the uh, proposals here. Well, that's, I think that's, um, if I'm understanding what you're getting at, that's, you know, if you look at our, our roadmap presentation, that's all laid out how we see, you know, the timing of the, the RA enhancements relative to these enhancements. That's that's all in there. You shouldn't have to go to the re release users group to get the, the anticipated implementation dates. We we painted a three-year roadmap along with the policy development process and the implementation of the all these various changes. So you can see how they fit together. That's, yeah, I'll, that's, I'll follow up offline, Brad. <laughs> Thanks. There's there are no other comments in the room or on the lines or from the committee. We ran over, as I warned you we might, but I thought it was worthwhile. And Don, thanks for preparing this. And of course, we're going to be talking a lot more about the uh, DME and then ultimately EDAM issues over the next year. So, uh, <clears throat> operator, this concludes the uh, market surveillance committee meeting. You can sign off. And uh, we'll see you at the next MSC meeting, which is tentatively April 5th. We it, it confirmed April 5th, and we'll also be adopting some MSC, a couple of MSC opinions before then, if all goes well. Okay, thanks very much. Operator, you can uh, turn it off. Thanks, Roy. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.